morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors meeting. Today is March 30, 2021, and this meeting is hereby called to order. I'm going to ask our clerk to please call the roll and establish quorum. Uh, Supervisors Desmond. Here. Frost. Here. Kennedy. Here. Natoli. Here. And Cerna. Here. And I apologize, but I don't have my... I don't have my um, meeting statement. Just do it from memory. I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. We've got time. OK. Uh, can okay. you go with your announcements and start sure, with that? And of I'll course. pull them up. Thank you. Yes. In compliance with the directives of the county, state, and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, this meeting is live streamed and closed to the public. Temporary procedures are subject to change pursuant to guidelines related to social distancing and minimizing person-to-person -person contact. To make a verbal content comment at today's meeting, dial 916-875-2500 and follow the prompts to be placed in a queue for a specific agenda item or off agenda matter. Please refer to the agenda and or watch the meeting to follow along and determine when the best time to call to be placed in the queue to make a public comment. You may be on hold for up to an extended period of time and your patience is appreciated. When I open public comments for a specific agenda item or off agenda matter, the clerk will begin transferring you into the meeting. Each agenda item queue will remain open until the public comment period is closed for that specific item. Members of the public are limited to making one com public comment per agenda item or off agenda matter. Please be mindful of the public comment procedures to avoid being interrupted or disconnected when making more than one public comment on a single agenda item or off agenda matter. Thank you in advance for your courtesy and understanding. Written comments are all, always accepted. Please send your email comment to boardclerk at saccounty.net. Your comment will be routed to the board and filed in the record. Thank you again for your patience. Okay, so this meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T UVerse cable systems. The meeting is closed caption and is webcast at sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated, repeated Friday, April 2nd at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. This meeting is also broadcast live on KUBU Radio on 96.5 FM. A DVD copy is also available for checkout from any local library branch. Thank you. And I w wonder, Supervisor Cerna, if you would be kind enough to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I guess we're ready to move into our timed matters. Okay, so for your um, item today, you only have one item. This is to direct staff to continue developing a 24-7 mental health crisis response system to be included in the county's fiscal year 2021-22 revised recommended budget. Good morning. Good morning. Bruce Wagstaff, Deputy County Executive. I want to thank you for this special meeting today to go over uh, this important proposal that we've been working so hard on. Um, I wanted to offer some initial comments and then we're going to turn it over to our Acting Director of Health Services, Jim Hunt, to do the full presentation. But there has been a lot of work done on this proposal since the last time that we were before you. Um, today we are providing the uh, feedback that you requested on three different models for how we might approach this system. Uh, and we have continued our effort to have extensive discussions in the community with various stakeholders, including at your request, the various police chiefs uh, from the cities within our county. You, you learn on a project like this that as you do more, you learn more. Um, and as you're going to hear in Jim's presentation, there have been some significant events that affect what we're recommending to you as an approach on this system. In particular, at the federal level, uh, you'll hear Jim describe that at, in the New Relief Act, there is significant funding 
that is available for projects like this at the enhanced federal Medicaid rate uh, that we certainly want to uh, look at and explore and really could have a tremendous impact on what we propose and certainly how we fund what we propose. We've also had discussions at the state level because at the state level there is a legislative effort underway to establish a statewide system along these lines. So we want to make sure that we're up to speed on everything that's going on there and make recommendations to you that are consistent with that. So um, a lot of work being done. We're happy to present this uh, feedback to you today. We look forward to a dialogue with you on this and your direction. And I'll turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Bruce. Well, Bruce is certainly right. The more you look at something like this, the more you learn. Well, good morning. Great to be here. Jim Hunt, your acting director of health services. As Bruce mentioned, you had some very specific requests for us at our last hearing on February 24th that we develop proposals for call center and crisis response, mobile crisis response, seven days a week at 8, 16, and 24 hours uh, each. Now, I have to say, Flo Evans and her staff are just wonderful and do a very good job on your behalf to let departments know exactly what you expect from us. And this, this is the laundry list that uh, Flo and her staff put together as follow-up items from our last meeting. And I, I just want to talk about uh, some of them. Actually, I want to talk about all of them. Uh, but what we've learned in the last five weeks is that, uh, as Bruce said, the more you do, the more you learn. And we still have a long way to go. But here's what we've done on each one of these. Exploring funding options we have, and much of that will be included in this presentation. Working with local, school, local jurisdictions, we have, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, notably, we've met with uh, city police chiefs. We had an individual, individual meeting with the Citrus Heights police chief, representing all of the city police chiefs, and then had a subsequent uh, virtual meeting with all of the city police chiefs. Uh, our sheriff's department participated in our initial planning, and they, of course, will be included in future meetings as well. Collect one year of 911 data. That's done thanks to our sheriff's office, and I'll present that in uh, one of the graphs in a few minutes. Determine if the program impacts consent decree. I think you heard in a previous presentation from uh, Britt Ferguson that we looked at that and any impact would be very minimal and certainly isn't going to help us with a consent decree. Excuse me, Jim, Supervisor Natoli has a question. Yeah, Jim, just a uh, backup way on that chart. I was going to ask you, when working with the local jurisdictions, so I heard you say you met with the police chiefs virtually. Was the sheriff's office represented because they provide under contract to both the city of Rancho Cordova and the city of Ialton. So did they have a representative on the, on the call? Ialton was not. Well, no, Ialton, is, it's a sheriff's contract. Right. Uh, 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 I don't believe so. Uh, Supervisor, we've, ha we've had the sheriff's department involved in our planning effort on this since day one on this. They weren't on that particular call because okay. we wanted to reach out to those chiefs that we had not yet talked to. Okay. So that was the focus of our call. Okay. No, I appreciate the, the follow-up. Again, obviously, we had heard that, you know, from, from a number of the jurisdictions. I was just curious because, and I, you know, the police chief in Ranch Cordova, obviously, is appointed by the city council, but that's still contracted right. under, under the sheriff's department. And Ialton, obviously, very small jurisdiction, but nonetheless, those services down there are provided by the sheriff under contract as well. So, right. okay. So they've been, they've been integral into the discussions uh, as relates to to all this, the and sheriff's department have to has. be a part of future discussions. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. The city of Galt was represented. Their chief was on the call. Okay. Good. Thanks. <laughs> uh, determine how program can integrate with current jurisdictional response systems. Uh, that obviously is a part of our meeting uh, with the city police chiefs. Uh, but notably, we want to be able to coordinate with the city's uh, Department of Community Response. You may have seen the article in the paper over the weekend about what they're trying to do. And Dr. Quist has been in contact with Bridget Dean, their department director, and more will follow. Uh, we want to complement their efforts, not conflict or compete. And it's, it's really extremely important that we do coordinate and fully understand what we're both doing. And hopefully we can develop a program that will be mutually beneficial and uh, really be a benefit for all of our people in Sacramento. 
reach out to Weave. We've done that. Uh, we have a good relationship with them. I expect that to continue. They are a fabulous resource and uh, will continue to be a great partner. Look into federal legislative efforts, as Bruce mentioned. We've done that, and uh, we'll discuss some of that in the presentation. Reach out to the Chronic Offenders Program. That'll be part of our discussions with the police departments. Provide cost savings. We have not done that. We're just too early in the process to try and give you any kind of a figure on that. Look into using COVID relief funds. The $59 million that recently came down is entitled the Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity Funding. Uh, and the State Department of Public Health is taking a very literal interpretation of that on our requests for some things that might fall just outside of that parameter. They have told us they're not allowable. And uh, so it's, it's pretty clear that this program uh, for crisis response is not going to be able to be funded through that money. So we talked about uh, full year uh, calls for service. Thanks to the Sheriff's Department, they have provided us with their 2019 calls for mental health service. Uh, and as you can see from their footnote, these, you know, this is not an exact science, but these are the best numbers they have and, and we're relying on them for uh, gauging when during the day these types of responses are required. And this is very much in line with the last presentation where we showed you five months of data from 2020. And uh, it, it's just a, a little amusing that it's it just completely opposite what you expect. The principal time when we see these calls is midday. What we did determine was that uh, the day shift includes about 53.4% of all calls and the 16-hour coverage, which would be the day shift and a swing shift, would receive about 87% of all calls. Excuse me, Jim. Uh, Supervisor Desmond. Sir. Sorry, thanks, Jim. I was just on this slide specifically. Did you um, get any additional statistics from the cities that you've been talking to about their 911 calls? No. Okay. Because I think that would be very helpful to see that, too, because I, I imagine it's going to be more than double this, maybe triple well, yes, what this, we see here. And I should say... This uh, is a minimal number. I mean, you look at the total number of 1,500, uh, that does not encompass the universe. And it also doesn't encompass those folks who are reluctant or afraid to call 911. Uh, and what we see in other jurisdictions is a dramatic increase in calls if there's a standalone call center. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So looking at program models, uh, we looked at the STAR program model, and you're familiar with this. Excuse me, Supervisor Kennedy. I'm sorry, Jim. I yes, jumped in late because I wanted to follow up on that. So these numbers are strictly unincorporated area? Correct. Okay, so that would dramatically change if we were to include yes. just the city of Sacramento. Even. Yes. Okay, thank you. As Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, again, while we're on that chart, um, Jim, so I, I went back and pulled the material that was as you just referenced, uh, given to us for January, May of 2020, that period of time, this is for the entire calendar year of 2019. Um, the charts are populated a little differently. I mean, if you did a side-by-side -side comparison, again, recognizing you have a full year here, um, and I look at the one <coughs> from, it was given out at the hearing in February for the board, and the concentration is still in that same that general area, but if, but I'm looking at it, and there were, and I won't call them anomalies because I'm not sure they should, I, that's probably not the right term, but there were on either end of that spectrum some oranges and reds uh, that now are you know either different shades of green, uh, and right. or, and so again, it, and it, you know it's reflective obviously of the way this you know the calls are pulled when they come in. And I guess I'd be curious, is there any way for them to pull the entire 2020 so we could see that as we're talking about this? Uh, you know, I know this requires a good deal of effort to do yes, this, but yes. but, but th this is, you know, the currency of 2019 is a little bit dated when you compare it against 2020 and obviously 2021, I mean, again, it's dependent upon so many factors, but I mean, one of the conver parts of the conversation we had, and you're gonna get to this in a minute was, you know, the coverage, you know, eight hours, 16 or 24, but that, that, you know, this chart, if I finally look at the one that's up there now, 
you know, you look at from the hours from, uh, you know, I guess 12 a.m. to, to 5 a.m., and it's nearly entirely green, but that wasn't the case, again, relative to the numbers that we saw for the first part of 2020. And right. so, um, again, you're not, you know, predicting, putting forth any particular argument here as far as your recommendation, but I just want to say that the concentration is still here, but there was, on either end of the spectrum, a, a little more um, weight that went towards some of those areas, some of those you know, early, early, early morning hours or late evening right. hours. Right. Agreed. Well, I'm sure Flo will let us know that we need to look at the full year 2020 data when we come back in September. Okay. Well, again, if it's available, I know that, you know, people, it, you know. The, the sheriff is very good about that, and I'm sure that they will have that available if they don't already. Okay. And, and the reason I make the point, though, is, you know, this is a picture in time. Obviously, this is 12 right. months reflected here. We had, you know, five months reflected, or six months reflected in, or a full five months reflected in the information the last time. So as we're having the conversation, which we'll get into budget, to resources, to how we design a program, I just think it's important for us to have as, as, as much current data as possible uh, for the consideration of this before this board. So, right. again. Agreed. Okay. And I think having both 2019 and 2020 will be important. And the reason we showed this one is because this was a non-COVID year. Yeah. Now, whether that really impacted what happened on the graveyard shift uh, okay. is debatable. That's fair. And I think to Supervisor Kennedy's point too, again, you've now engaged with the police chiefs. I think if if there's a way through their own dispatch uh, and or their own accounting for that, if there's data that they, you know, again, <clears throat> want to share and maybe using the same uh, metrics if possible so that it's a, you know, it's a, it's a fair addition to the chart. But I think that would be helpful as we're talking about this okay. and, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, weight of the impacts uh, as far as numbers and so whether it's the city of sacramento or city of elk grove city of citrus size pick your city um if they're you know if they're engaged and they have a way to to pull that up i think it would be useful for because, because again the numbers will be relative obviously uh, larger uh but it may it, but it, again it may fill this chart out or it may make it even a deeper you know hue of red or green in some of the areas so i just um I think we could ask them. They've obviously asked of us to meet and to be a part of the process. I think uh, their contribution could be if they could give us some of the data where they think if they applied some of the same uh, metrics that the sheriff did in, in, in calling out the data, data for our consideration. So we'll we'll just offer that, that as a suggestion. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thank you, Supervisor Natoli. Supervisor Cerna. Yeah, just a, a brief comment on that. It seems to me that uh, we might actually want to consider um, throwing out 2020 because the whole year, regardless of, of uh, COVID, we also had a great deal of civil unrest. That's true. Um, and uh, I'd actually be more interested in looking back maybe through five years from 2014 through uh, 2019. I think that's going to give us probably a better uh, impression of what the actual um, quote unquote normal year uh, call dynamic is going to uh, look like because I I mean, in a year where we're not just when we not only had a pandemic, but we had other law enforcement agencies, including CHP, that uh, was assisting local law enforcement uh, during the summer of 2020. I mean, pick a year that didn't have the National Guard present. Um, <laughs> so it seems to me that, that, that 2020 uh, in and of itself is probably extremely, um, uh, you know, different than, than what a normal year would, would represent. I'm just that's kind of a anecdotal assumption but um, I think it's a safe one well your, your assumption is correct we have seen um, some negative impacts from COVID-19 and people having to uh, shelter in place for extended periods of time kids not being in school and the uh, resultant problems from that so I certainly agree so we've talked briefly about the star program it's in a limited service area in the city of Denver and only is uh, in place from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. and they handle about 3 percent of 911 calls and they get all their calls through the 911 dispatch center. But what's interesting about them is uh, from June of 2020 to November 2020 they received 748 calls and only 313 were directly from 911. 260 were from Denver police officers out in the field who rest requested assistance and this is something that police chiefs brought to our attention that when an officer is on the scene and has a person in crisis, they haven't committed a crime to justify taking them to jail. They're not necessarily a threat uh, 
to themselves or others, but they need some help. And uh, so they call uh, the STAR program mobile response teams, and I expect to see the same. Uh, interestingly, 175 of those calls were self-initiated by a STAR unit that was already out in the field. A CAHOOTS serves the Eugene Springfield area, which has about 15% of Sacramento's population, so it's considerably smaller. It does operate 24-7, and its calls uh, come through both the 911 uh, phone number, and they have uh, separate 10-digit phone numbers, one for Eugene, one for Springfield. The outside numbers from Eugene and Springfield flow into the 911 call center, the Central Lane County 911 center. And uh, the center answers 911 calls first. And if there's a backup of calls, the uh, non-emergency calls get held until there's a dispatcher available. In Maricopa County, Maricopa is the largest county in Arizona and one of the largest in the country. Uh, the population is 4.6 million, so they're about three times our size. And they receive about 200,000 calls annually to their standalone call center. Uh, they also receive a number of calls from uh, 911 dispatch, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, and they do cover the entire county of Maricopa. I want to talk to you about crisis now. This is something that we discovered as we looked and became available to us. Excuse um, me, Jim. Yes. Uh, we do have a question about the last slide, uh, Supervisor Desmond. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Th thanks, Jim. I'm sorry to interrupt you here. I, I just want to ask this because I, I'll, I'll forget if I don't. Sure. The, uh, the STAR program and the CAHOOTS program, I think you mentioned at least CAHOOTS, they have also have, in addition to, to working with 911, they have a standalone number as well, correct? Do you know how many calls came into that standalone number no. during this time period? I think, I think that would be important to, to note for both those programs because I imagine they also get a lot of calls directly to that standalone number, oh, I, yes. I would imagine. And then kind of on the flip side, in Maricopa County, do you know, I mean, I know you have the stats for how many calls to the standalone center, but I imagine they also, you know, law enforcement or fire or whomever, that there's a mechanism to transfer a 911 call over to them. Do you know how many of those occur as part of this research? I do for the city of Phoenix, and I'll show that in a moment. Okay, terrific. And then I just want to make one comment about the point you made as far as the number of, of calls that came in from officers out in the field. I mean, I, could, I, can, I can think of so many situations that I, I've been in the course of my career, in my prior career in the highway patrol, where it's very, very common to get called out to a scene where someone's running around in traffic and they're clearly exhibiting signs of you know, mental illness. Well, you can't have a behavioral health person show up there and shut down traffic and shut down roadways and things like that, but it would have been great to have the opportunity to have someone come out to a scene like that after you get the scene kind of safe. And so I could certainly see many occasions where that would happen, um, you know, law enforcement working with these folks. So, okay, thank you. Okay, I'll count that as a yes vote for our mobile response teams. <clears throat> Okay, whoops, let me see, I wasn't quite finished there. Um, the crisis, no, I guess I was. Uh, so, Crisis Now uh, is sponsored and endorsed by the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, we were fortunate to find this group. It's an international consulting firm, and they developed the Crisis Now model, which has been implemented in a number of jurisdictions, and it is purely a non-law enforcement intervention for a person's receiving, uh, experiencing a behavioral health crisis. Uh, they were invited to California and funded by the California Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. And we have utilized RI International to inform our discussion to provide some background data and projection models. And yes, it is very nice to have an internationally recognized consultant working for us at no cost. Now, their service has been invaluable in giving us insight into other jurisdictions that have successfully implemented an alternative 911, and most notably in Georgia and Maricopa County, Arizona, although they've also done it in the United Kingdom and Alaska. Uh, much of this morning's presentation is based on the experience that has been seen in uh, Maricopa County. So in Maricopa County, this is their total crisis calls 
that they received between uh, December 2019 and December 2020, a little over 200,000 per year. Uh, and I focused on Maricopa County for a few reasons. One, they have a fully implemented program model. They're uh, operating countywide in a large county in a western state, and they run a 24-7 program. Uh, all of these are factors we'd like to have here in Sacramento County. So these are the calls you act about, ask about being referred from 911 to the call center, and this is just for the city of Phoenix. And the city of Phoenix is almost exactly the same population as Sacramento County. Uh, we see uh, in Maricopa County, they've got 38 different cities, including Phoenix, Mesa, Tempe, Scottsdale. Uh, so there's a lot of different jurisdictions. And the uh, number of calls that are diverted from 911 to the Crisis Now Network is uh, about 450 a month or over 5,400 annually. And in our last hearing in February, you requested uh, the ability to look at a comparison of annualized data. This does give you that for these two years in, in Phoenix, but it really isn't helpful for making uh, projections or planning purposes, because if you look, you'll see the month of December was the lowest in 2019 and the highest in 2020. And similarly, March was the highest month in 2019 and the second lowest in 2020. So there's a great deal of variability and not a pattern that we could really look to for planning purposes. Going the other way, uh, these are calls referred back from the crisis center to 911. And while some of these could be because there's a, a threat or a danger, maybe a weapon uh, present when a person calls in about a crisis situation, it's just as likely and perhaps more likely that someone's calling in because they found their loved one passed out on a bed with an empty bottle of sleeping pills next to them and they need a paramedic response. Those automatically we would move over to 911 for a medical response. The uh, average here is about four and a half, excuse me, 0.45%, which means about 900 calls annually or about 75 a month. So the crisis now model has three factors, call center, a crisis response, and a facility. And we're looking at three different options. A standalone, which is uh, strongly recommended by the community, a 911 dispatch, which is favored by law enforcement, and uh, a third option too, clinicians co-located uh, within a 911 dispatch center. Now the, um, the use of a number other than 911 addresses the reluctance or even fear that many people have of calling law enforcement. This certainly has been voiced in our public forums and you heard a, a strong voice at our last hearing uh, advocating for a non-law enforcement number. 911 dispatch, uh, you're very familiar with that, so I won't belabor that. Clinicians with 911, this approach could provide a closer collaboration between law enforcement and the clinicians. It's used in the city of Houston and uh, in some jurisdictions in Georgia, uh, while other call centers in Georgia have a standalone number. With 159 counties and 528 cities, you can understand why there might be a variation in Georgia. And I know, Supervisor Kennedy, you want to ask me, why are there so many counties in Georgia? Well, the story is that the counties were formed so that a farmer with his mule team could go from his home to the courthouse and back in one day. That's the extent of the boundaries of those counties. Mm. Uh, actually, a more likely scenario is back then it was uh, more of an electoral college type system, and they wanted to make sure that the uh, rural areas had uh, greater representation in the cities. Does that mean that San Bernardino has really fast horses then? <laughs> <laughs> they, must, they must have. Okay. Uh, so it's some considerations about call centers. Uh, many people have advocated for an easy to remember three digit phone number for mental health crisis calls. And last time I was here, we didn't have any options for them. Well. 988 will become active nationally when the Federal Communications Commission turns the switch you know, on July 1st of 2022. It's intended as a suicide prevention hotline and mental health crisis phone number. 
And states need to opt in to this to adopt that. Within California, AB 988 is one piece of legislation that would do that. It's an active piece of legislation with uh, multiple interest groups weighing in on possible changes. We're following it closely as it might have a significant impact on our planning. As originally written, it would mandate 911 adoption statewide as an alternative to 911. The fate of the legislation is unknown. It's, I mean, since I submitted the board report, things have changed. It's undergoing a, a, a lot of a discussion and uh, quite honestly the last time we heard about it it looked a lot different than what's written excuse uh, me supervisor kennedy had a question actually it's just as much of a statement based upon this slide um because as we see here it's federal 988 suicide prevention and and i still hold firmly you know have not had my mind changed that a um, standalone number is still needed and we can find a three-digit number now. If it's 988, fantastic. I, I don't care what it is, frankly. Um, but you know, the the 911 has been around since 1968. It's going to take a while, an aggressive media and public relations campaign to get it ingrained in people's minds that that's not who you call in this circumstance. <laughs> Thus, why um, you know that to do a seamless transition is going to be difficult but we're going to have to get in people's psyche that so that we all know 911 i mean we were you know well some of us born you know doing 911 and um and understand what it is but forget to get people to to really just without thinking about it knowing where to call i do think that we have to segregate it and make it you know don't mix the message that's number one number two is we talk about the federal 988 suicide prevention behavioral health emergency response when i first started talking about this during the budget it was more than just the way i envisioned it and the way i had when i had spoken to our health many of our health partners who you know they talked about the economies of scale and the efficiencies of having other things within this um, you know, for example, the suicide prevention. One way to get to the suicide prevention hotline is called 211. Well, nobody knows that. Right. Um, but if we had a number that was out there that people said that's the number for mental health, they would know that's who you call for suicide prevention. I mean, I think that I, I, I'm hoping that we're not, you know, now I, I realize that these things have to be done incrementally and that we have taxed our staff tremendously over the last 45 days or whatever. Um, with this, but I hope that we're going to look beyond just 911, you know, um, getting people out of the 911 system, and we're also going to look at how this can better serve all of the behavioral health needs of the community. Does that make yeah. sense? Yes. Okay. Well, I want to be real clear that the department has not taken a position yet on what we want to do, mm -hmm. and we understand your uh, advocacy for 988, and we certainly understand the the uh, community's advocacy for 988. So it's uh, it's certainly uh, very strong in the mix. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so at any rate, uh, implementing legislation is being considered. Uh, there's also considerations of introducing different bills that might address this issue as well. But uh, 988 is coming, and uh, it will be impact. Uh, it, it will impact our planning, and will be in, in uh, effect July 1 of 2022. Now, if we do go down this route and use 988, uh, that would require a lot of uh, coordination with law enforcement. And uh, we've talked to law enforcement about this. And I think what would have to happen is a meeting of the minds about what calls 988 would handle, what types would have to go to 911, and vice versa as well. And it would likely require MOUs with each of the city police departments on how we handle that. Now, if we implement a program using a standalone call center before July 1st, 2022, uh, thanks to uh, David Villanueva and his uh, staff, we have reserved a 10-digit number, Get Care is the, the name of it, if we want to uh, implement a standalone center before 988 is in force. Excuse me, uh, I just want to say I like the idea of a three-digit number better, and Supervisor Cerna has a comment. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, do you know, uh, Jim, whether or not the, uh, the state, uh, legislation has in it the, um, authorization for the surcharge? Yes. 
okay. as originally written it does. Okay, all right. Which provides some funding, which is, uh, I mean, just like 911 is funded by a surcharge, at least partially funded by a 911 surcharge, the 988 would include a, a surcharge as well to help us fund call centers. Thank you. Mobile response teams. Um, using the crisis now model uh, gives us a, a number of 12 or 13 teams. When we actually laid it out uh, shift by shift, uh, our staff suggested 14 teams. We'll refine that when we come back in uh, September. But using the 12 uh, teams as a basis, uh, we've developed our estimates. And these teams would be uh, mental health professionals and peers with lived experience. And ideally, the peers would have lived experience with homelessness and a lot of the other issues that will be faced by the folks that are in crisis that we'll have to go out and respond to. Um, the clinical supervision is something we hadn't discussed before. And uh, in staffing our teams with mental health professionals, I think it's very important. Uh, when a uh, employment candidate gets their Master of Social Work degree, they are eligible to be a mental health counselor. And uh, hiring them right out of college, out of their, uh, with their MSW, uh, and training them for a couple of months in what we want them to do as part of a call center or mobile response team. We'll give them the tools they need to do uh, to be successful out there. With the clinical supervision of senior mental health counselors who have their uh, license, this will allow the mental health counselors to get the necessary experience under the clinical supervision to progress to be senior mental health counselors and to get their own licenses. And this is really attractive to new graduates and so it, I think, not only broadens our uh, pool of eligible candidates, it gives them a better look at a career ladder within the county and what we would hope would be a long and successful career. Supervisor Natoli had a question. Yeah, thank you, Jim, for, I think, uh, you know, pointing out what some of the career paths, but certainly some of the expertise that could come with the clinical model you just described and the supervision. Did I hear you correctly? You said September? You come back to sept in September? Well, we're coming back with our proposal for implementation in the, what does Britt call it? The uh, adjusted recommended budget, uh, for the final budget hearings with an implementation plan. I saw the adjusted recommended budget, but I wasn't, so it didn't say September. I saw that in the staff report. So the reason I asked that is that then you come back with final recommendations. But just as we had the conversation a year ago, June, about, you know, roping off some money, came back in September, we roped off money. We obviously looked at an expanded approach here. Then that would put implementation probably well into and again, there are many moving parts here, so I want to just <clears throat> talk to the to a specific part of this, but puts implementation well into uh, 2020, 2022. I mean, time you hire up, and uh, if you're going to have the separate number and so forth. I mean, so from the time we you know kind of initiated the conversation, and certainly with the you know the you know, good work of colleague this Professor Kennedy, you know that's a two year. Yeah, yeah roll out before you roll it out so i guess and i just wanted to here, here's kind of to the essence of my question though so is your ability again if you have a framework and you know you're going to go you know whatever the final action is to for hours and so forth but could, is there the ability to stand up some teams that could be available during some of the most critical hours and do that in advance of the entirety of the program and you know you, you talked about a phased approach or a pilot program the last time we were in hearing on this it just seems to me that that really drags this out, well, not intentionally, but I, but I, you know, I, I guess, so my question is, could you begin to stand up no. with some folks to actually be out in the field and start doing this now? I think that's possible, Supervisor, but I also want to make a couple of points, too, okay. because as we've worked on this, we've all wanted to move as fast as possible on this, but we're not developing it in a vacuum, either. There are events that are happening, and I think we'd be ill-advised if we didn't consider what's happening at the statewide level. And the fact that we're going to have a statewide system uh, in 2022, as well as what's happening at the federal level, which, as I said earlier, could significantly impact the funding of this proposal and allow us to consider things we might not be able to consider without that. The guidelines for that funding haven't even come out yet. 
Yeah. No. So I, I just wanted to not sound defensive about it, but point out that we're not developing this on our own. There are surrounding events that we have to take into account, I think. But we can certainly look at what we can do in advance of, of that, as you suggest. And certainly, if we can move faster on this, we will. Yeah. Um, that's our desire. But no, no, it, it, it's clear. And I think you know from what was in the written report, what you you know certainly started with this morning, certainly what Jim's going through here, that it's not in a vacuum. But my my point being is that um, you know we've already set aside a million and a half uh, for this for this budget year. We'll be into another budget year. We'll make decisions that may be of a significantly larger sum of money on a, a potentially ongoing basis with federal and or state participation. But I guess bring it back to the question, and you in part answered it, is there the ability, if you're going to look at two-person teams, to, to start building your team? You know, uh, you maybe use an analogy about it. You know, you draft some folks and, you know, have them available, right. uh, you know, even with the current 911 system to begin to address issues. And again, we're, if we're going to be build this, you know, bigger, but you're going to have people that then would have some experience. Uh, you got to have some protocols. I get it, um, but um, stand this up uh, because otherwise you're not going to stand it up. All things understood here about you know the, the additional dollars and the cost and having in protocols in place that are appropriate for response and proper referrals and all the things you've talked about and are still going to cover. But it seems to me that that's just a long time. Meanwhile, every day, day in and day out, mental health crises occur. Right. And good or bad things can happen, I guess. So that's my point. And, and we understand that. And again, I'm, and it's not to push back on you or for the good work. And you've done some yeoman's work here just in the last five weeks. And, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm very appreciative. And I think the community is as well. I'm just no, point well taken. Maybe, yeah. Pel, point well taken. We can certainly look at that and see what we might be able to do. Bear in mind also that we have our mobile crisis teams out right. there, too, right. that we're staffing up. Um, and as we've heard before uh, from Dr. Quist, there's been recruitment issues there, but he's working hard to get those fully operational, too. So we'd have those out there operating as this work is uh, Well, and, and maybe part of that is to expand the hours. It's not, you know, mobile crisis team not being from, you know, 8 to 7 or whatever it is, the hours is to, to get a couple of teams that would be available on weekends, uh, you know, maybe, use, you know, building off of that existing model, but to begin to have more presence when people need it. And again, you know, we've got this charted out and, you know, whether you'd have 24 seven, you know, coverage right out the, the shoot, I right. don't know, but right now we're still limited with mobile crisis teams. You don't, you know, they're not right. I forget what the hours are, but it, it's certainly not around the clock. So, right. Or on weekends. Yeah, we can look at that. So, okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Where was I? <laughs> I just want to talk just briefly about, again, those two-person teams. Uh, we believe that this combination of a clinician along with um, a peer embodies the kind of um, clinical skills and empathy that would be necessary to successfully deal with folks uh, who experience a crisis. The call centers. Uh, Using the algorithm developed by RI International for a county our size, we'd expect to see about 78,000 calls to a standby call center, a standalone call center, once the program is fully operational. And uh, we use the experience of Maricopa County to develop this cost estimate. Uh, when we return to your board with a full implementation plan, we'll develop a detailed cost estimate with specific positions for your consideration and adoption. Uh, these numbers are presented to give you an idea, to give you a ballpark of what we're looking at right now. And of course, we can certainly look at your uh, recommendation, uh, Supervisor Natoli, to uh, move forward in advance of uh, uh, September, see if, how we can uh, work with our law enforcement partners, partners to uh, work out the details and perhaps get the folks out there after normal hours or mm -hmm. somehow uh, supplement what we're doing now with the mobile crisis teams. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. <clears throat> Jim, uh, before you leave this slide, was this, I, I understand this is a, a pretty rough estimate, but is it based on a, uh, like a common unit cost or cost per call or yes. how, how did you? No, this was based on Maricopa County's actual costs. Okay. And of course factored in for our size and the number of, of teams we'd have. And again, the, the 16 and 80 hour are based on the number of calls during those uh, shifts. Uh, Startup costs, 
um, would include the initial staff hiring and training prior to implementation, as well as operating costs uh, during the hiring and training process and equipment. Uh, the equipment for a standalone call center would include uh, one of those electronic geographic uh, location functions similar to what we have in a 911 call center. And that would allow the staff in the call center to see where the response teams are, what their status is, where calls originate, and other information to help us be most effective. Of course, if a 911 call center uh, option is adopted, that would not be needed. Mobile response costs, with 78,000 calls annually, it's projected that 12,300 fuel responses would occur. And the projected cost is based on the National Suicide Prevention Hotline's experience. And once again, a detailed budget proposal will be presented to you in September based on what we believe we would actually need here. And again, as with the call center, the 16 and 8 hour estimates are just based on the call volume during those at times. Supervisor Natoli. Yeah. Jim, in, in looking at the three models, um, here we have our fire dispatch has a, a separate system. You get 911 and there's fire dispatch, and you know that's been designed, the county's been uh, certainly integral to making sure that we had coverage throughout the county. When you call a fire department, obviously you're calling either for you know, uh, fire or an, another emergency incident uh, where folks, you know, medical responders are responding. I guess I'm curious, has, uh, do uh, any of the models have any association with their first responders who, you know, paramedics, uh, you're, you know, have life support, uh, responding to, certainly to accidents uh, in the field. They respond, you know, roadways, homes, businesses. Um, and all hours of the day and night. I'm just curious as we look at this, and you know, that's not, you know, it's not directly associated with, with, with law enforcement, but I'm just wondering with the fire response, and there's, you know, significant coordination uh, on that. Is there any opportunity to, um, you know, build off of that model? Because we have, a, you know, a, a separate dispatch system uh, for, for fire, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, it just seemed, seemed to me that, there might be some ability to, you know, in, in framing this and looking at this, uh, to talk with our, you know, emergency res first responders on the fire side of the of the uh, equation. We'll look into that. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to follow up on those comments. I I, I agree with Supervisor Natoli. I've thought about this a lot. I mean, we're we're, we're trying to, to characterize these calls. We want to put them more in the healthcare arena, right? This is an emergency behavioral health issue that they're responding to, these, these non-law enforcement teams. And I think that's a, a really great point that Supervisor Natoli makes. I mean, we, we have an existing system, we have an existing um, very close coordination between law enforcement. And in the state of California, just so you know, law enforcement is the public safety answering point for every 911 call in mm -hmm. the state. Cell calls all go to Highway Patrol dispatch almost everywhere in the state. And then landlines go to, um, with some exceptions, go to the local police department public safety answering point. And then those calls are triaged. They're transferred very frequently to either EMS or fire or whomever. If it's a non-emergency call, sometimes it's transferred to a non-emergency responder, depending on what that jurisdiction has set up. But I think, I think that's a great point. And, and I, you know, I'm thinking, as Supervisor Natoli was ta talking about this, it, it seems to me we could even while you're still having the discussions with the chiefs of police and the other jurisdictions, and you're waiting to see how the state legislation shakes out. And I'll take a, a, a quote from my, my colleague, Supervisor Cerna, in the context of the Community Review Commission. You know, whatever we set up today, it, it doesn't mean that's gonna be the permanent version of this. But, but it seems to me we could get some teams on the ground pretty pretty quickly and maybe just focus on just the unincorporated area and maybe you just do it through the fire dispatch um, so I just want to echo those those comments uh, that supervisor totally made okay thank you thank you supervisor Desmond hey okay. the third leg of the crisis now model is for a crisis center someplace where we can take folks who are in crisis when we cannot resolve the situation in the field and uh, back in my day, in the good old days, the uh, mental health treatment center was a place where police 
uh, ambulances uh, could bring folks who are in crisis, uh, 5150, whatever it may be, and have it handled. Well, budget reductions eliminated that program. What we have now is the urgent care clinic, which operates from 10 to 10, to be uh, truly responsive and provides the service that's needed. We would want to expand that to 24-7. And uh, that is a contracted function, and we would expand that contract by three and a half million dollars. And those costs are eligible for Medi-Cal funding at 50%. And we estimate that about 80% of the people that would show up there would be Medi-Cal eligible. So we'd see 40% uh, federal financial participation, which was certainly help out. So. There's lots of coordination and, and uh, consultation, collaboration that needs to occur to implement this. And these are just some of the folks that we need to um, work with to make sure that every voice is heard and that while we're certainly not going to please everybody, we at least have to hear everybody's concerns and, and seriously consider them. Uh, we've had a number of uh, groups that we hadn't uh, talked with before. Uh, come and ask to be included in the planning process, we'll do that. We uh, want to make sure that people are heard and uh, that we can use their imaginations, their innovative ideas of those people and organizations to help us form the best possible program. And of course, it's imperative that we have a collaborative relationship with law enforcement and it will likely result in uh, memorandums of understanding with the different law enforcement agencies in the county. And this happened since our last meeting, which is just fabulous news. Um, the American Rescue Plan Act adds mental health crisis mobile response teams as an optional Medicaid program element. And the legislation specifies that it must include a behavioral prof health, health professional, one of our mental health counselors, and either a nurse, social worker, or a peer support specialist. I mean, it looks like this thing was written just for us. Well, the fact of the matter is, uh, this good news can be attributed to Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon. Uh, he's chair of the Senate Finance Committee and a big fan of the CAHOOTS program. So this was inserted in that legislation to help out CAHOOTS and similar programs throughout the country. Um, and uh, while we would expect, as I said, about 80% of the, the folks we come in contact with to be uh, Medi-Cal eligible, that would reduce the amount of revenue we get to about 68%, but that is a very healthy shot in the arm to fund the, the mobile crisis teams. And this is already written into the law and only needs to be adopted by the state of California as an optional service in their Medi-Cal plan. Uh, we understand that the Department of Healthcare Services is already looking at this and we will follow up with their director and through the statewide uh, Behavioral Health Directors Association So, assuming your board approval of a program in September, these are the types of things that we are looking at that we need to do to fully implement. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, that marketing and advertising campaign doesn't, is key to getting people aware of uh, whatever service we're going to operate. If it's a 911, 988, uh, 988 and the uh, 10 digit number, either one would require a massive. Uh, public relations effort to get that number out there, get people used to it. Uh, and of course, that's very likely to be implemented by legislative actions and, uh, uh, quite frankly, by our administrative capacity to make things happen. Uh, the State Department of Healthcare Services has put forward the Cal AIM plan, and altogether is a very good, comprehensive plan to improve services of medical eligible persons in physical health, uh, mental health, and we want it to be successful. There is one quirk in that plan, and that is that mental health clients, seriously mentally ill persons, are currently served in Sacramento and Solano counties by Kaiser. And part of the Cal AIM proposal is to carve those folks out from Kaiser coverage and make them the responsibility of counties. Kaiser has done uh, an analysis of their data and for those individuals who they believe would be uh, transferred to counties and require 
us to provide service, they estimated 11,000 for both counties, about 8,000 for Sacramento County. This is effective January 1st, 2022. As you can imagine, assuming responsibility for 8,000 new seriously mentally ill patients is going to be a huge administrative task, uh, both actually clinically as well as physically. And two big pieces of that is one, ensuring a, a stable transition for those patients, as well as uh, expanding our capacity to serve them, which means uh, requests for proposal, analyzing, uh, awarding, contracting, uh, working with providers just to build the system. And those are not fast propositions. Um, CalAIM also changes our billing structure, clinical determinations, and uh, really for Sacramento and Solano County upsets the, the apple cart. Uh, we are glad to serve these people. We think we'll be able to serve them well, but we need time and we need money to do that. The uh, Assembly Health and Budget Subcommittees uh, have held hearings on this and the uh, members of the committee did express some reservations and had some very pertinent questions and two I was very glad to see. One was, does shifting the benefit back to the counties require state general fund backfill? And my answer to that is a resounding yes. And two, does the Department of Healthcare Services have a plan for continuity of care? Uh, that's a significant issue and anytime you disrupt a treatment plan um, to involuntarily transfer a patient from one provider to another uh, is a traumatic event and, and uh, we really don't want to see that occur. We're working with State Department of uh, Healthcare Services to uh, see how we can more easily transition this. We've made it clear we need adequate funding from them to ramp up our capacity to serve and we want a nice plan for our soon-to-be patients to transition from their current provider to us. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll have a positive resolution, but that remains to be seen. At the September budget hearings, we'll be returning to you with proposals for uh, how we manage this transition. Now, this has not been enacted yet, but uh, every indication is that it will be. We are going to try and get a delay in implementation, but uh, as it's written right now and planned, it would happen uh, January 1st of 2022. So this is, a, you know, as you can imagine, a huge uh, workload for our, our staff. Um, so 2021, 22 will be a very interesting year. And while we're planning on all these things, we're still managing to um, care for 30,000 men, women, and children in Sacramento County provide behavioral health services for them. So that concludes my presentation. What are your questions? Um, Supervisor CERN is queued up. I just want to ask you, keep referring to the budget hearings as September. We generally have them in June and true up in September. Is that the plan? Well, with this, the reason I mentioned September is because this legislation, or it's, not, it's not legislation, it's, a, it's an administrative plan that's getting some le legislative review. It would be implemented in uh, July 1. And so we don't know how that's going to be implemented yet. We don't know the revenue stream that might be associated with that. We don't know the transition plan for patients and probably won't until May or June. So that just wouldn't leave us time to bring you an implementation plan at the... But we definitely day. have to be mindful of it. <laughs> Yep. Yes, it could make the September uh, budget hearings a little different than what you're used to. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, just so we're clear, when you say the legislature, you're talking about AB 988? Is it, or are you talking about? AB 988 is a separate issue. This, okay. well, this is not a legislative issue. The Cal AIM is a plan by Cal the Department of Health Care oh, Services. Aim. Right, okay. right. Okay. I just, but if I may, Supervisor, sure. in addition to Cal AIM, you do have the AB 988 discussion going on, which will come to a head probably around July-ish. And we also want to see how the federal guidelines roll out. But the point's been made by the board looking at ways we can start something up perhaps earlier. Uh, but we're just cautious about going too far with a system that we might have to change. Although Supervisor Cerner's point is well taken that you can make adjustments, um, you just have to measure that. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Cerner. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Jim, for the um, 
uh, for the presentation and, and uh, being patient with us as we interrupted you several times. Uh, but you should be somewhat used to that by now. <laughs> <clears throat> He's a veteran. Um, one, one of the things that I, I haven't heard about, and, and I wonder if staff has given some thought to this, is uh, the way I understand it is that we are now, we, the county, are now uh, required to opt out of Laura's Law. Um, yes. and, and I know that we're doing some outreach around that seems to me that, um, that 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 might be an important part of this discussion is whether or not you know we land with uh, opting out or not how that might be a complement or a particular um, tool and toolbox for um, our crisis uh, uh, coordinators to to consider um, I know that that's that's kind of a longer term uh, element of, of not really well but but i mean it's not it's it's something that is um uh involves the courts and so uh, in terms of providing uh our clients our, our patients with uh different opportunities in this case under laura's law you know the benefits of conservatorship um what what has staff really thought about uh the intersection of that consideration, which is something that we're going to have to decide here fairly quickly, and um, developing this this new paradigm for crisis, interven crisis intervention. Well, as I see it, it's a tool to be used uh, for our mobile response teams. If uh, that situation arises, that's one of the one of the things they can uh, rely back, fall back on for treatment if necessary. Uh, I haven't considered it as part of our planning for this um, because of that. It, it's just one of those things that is a treatment option. If they're resistant to treatment under the uh, Laura's Law, we can compel treatment or use the threat of compulsion, if you will, to uh, get them to agree to voluntary services. But I don't think it would really impact how we develop the program. Okay. Um. Can you give me an example of how that how that would work in a you know uh, in a given like a particular incident where we don't ha we obviously don't have Laura's Law now we do have uh, Cares Plus but uh, which is some have called it Laura's Law Light but um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I just think it's it's a really uh, critical um, part of this discussion that we haven't had any uh, yet and so I'd like to understand more how you see that you know. Um, as a tool in the field, uh, given someone that's you know um, in crisis, and and how that would work with a conservator and with the the courts, and how does that become a uh, uh, um, a short term or medium term um, uh, benefit to the to the patient? When a mobile crisis team responds in the field, hopefully the person in crisis agrees to voluntary treatment. And we can refer them to their care provider or take them to the urgent care center or clinic. Uh, if they do not agree to that uh, under current law, there's not a lot we can do about it. Under Laura's law, if we opt into that, then we can discuss with them what the options are under Laura's law, that we would like them to accept treatment uh, if they're resistant, explain to them that the process is for us to go to court to compel them to receive treatment. Oftentimes, that will get them to agree. If not, you're right, it's a longer term process to actually get to court. And uh, in that instance, wouldn't be a help in the field. Uh, but again, that's, that's something that happens once we have the contact with the client. It's not something that happens in the call center. It's not something that's going to happen when we decide whether to dispatch. It's when we get out in the field and are actually face to face with a, a client to uh, try and resolve the crisis that that becomes an issue. And but we, we can certainly, I, I understand your concern, and we will include that in our, our discussions of how we uh, move I, forward. I just on this. think it's, it's a, it, it, it be, uh, behooves us to, to consider simultaneously the, the prospect of um, not opting out as we develop this. And um, I think another important question to, to 
ask and have answered is whether or not there's anything relative to the cost of implementing Laura's law, if that's what we should, uh, decide to do as a, as a county, that can be recoverable with, uh, uh, with the federal aid that you cited. Sure, we'll take a look at that. Because that, that also might be, um, while serendipitous, it might, it might just be probably an optimal time for us to, right. to really consider uh, not just the implementation of something new in terms of uh, conservatorship, but um, doing it at minimal risk to our general fund. You know, Supervisor, if you look at the federal relief bill, there's a whole section on mental health provisions, so we'll actively look at that because there could very well be an avenue there for us to uh, get some federal funding. Good, yeah. I, well, I'm hopeful that the next time we have a conversation about this in public, there's uh, at least one slide on Laura's Law and, and what, you know, what uh, opportunities we have around that. And I'd just like to uh, kind of add to that. I, my understanding of Laura's Law is that there are, uh, um, granted there is judgment involved, but it's not a matter of someone just walking up and saying, I think you look crazy. We think you need to be, uh, we're gonna take you to court. It's more a matter of there is a protocol if someone has um, had frequent incidents or is in a position of not being able to take care of themselves and they don't have the ability to make that choice to to get treatment and so it's a you know I do think we need to look at um, the policy and because that will be an important uh, consideration as we're deciding whether or not we want to take that on for Sacramento County I think um, it's not I didn't think it was described the way you just described it when they go out with that patient they talk with that one person doesn't do that it's when someone becomes a, a, you know a burden to the system they're um, having criminal activity they're not able to take care of themselves that it becomes uh, they they fall into this situation of having to address the Laura's law in court so I mean I would like to understand the specifics around that policy and how we would implement it and pay for it also we'll, we'll bring that to you when we come back with the question of opting in or opting out thank you does that conclude your presentation yes, that was pretty comprehensive um, I'm actually think it's getting better all the time it is it really <laughs> it's, is um, it's exciting and uh, a lot of uh, good information and i think it's going in a good direction i know uh, we've had a lot of questions along the way and i know we have some public comment uh, and i um, believe we did have some off agenda how do you want to do this how should we do this can we take the off agenda callers after this item or how should that might be most appropriate or should we listen to them first because we well you have seven off agenda callers and you have about 21 um, callers in queue for this item okay I, I think we should take the off agenda I apologize to the board uh, we I I'm out of sorts this morning the sun has <laughs> sunshine got to me and I apologize to the callers too <laughs> Um, so let's take them first. They've been waiting patiently, and then we'll go to the callers on this side. Thank you, Supervisor Frost. And I apologize. I should have called that out before we called this item in. Me. It's on me. Uh, please transfer the off agenda callers first. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments, and you have two minutes. And could you please mute the meeting in the background? Caller, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Can you start with your comments? Okay, I'm starting. Good day. I'm calling from the Body Politics House of Yahweh Israel Estate Thrift Funds LLC. 
can, yes, who condemn Sacramento County agents doing business de facto at Sacramento County of who continue since last Friday to willfully to conspire my willful admission to official duties for self-dealing to engage in criminal fraudulent conspiracy operating de facto to defraud the public of honest service. Arrest and prosecute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Good day. This is a formal three-day notice to perform or quit or be removed from office by bona fide encumbrance, RE3849519570US00.0001. Effectuated this day, Tuesday, March the 30th, 2021. To institute immediate removal from office according to each county agent's willful forfeiture from office by concealment. The offices of the Board of Supervisors via President Sue Frost and the office of the county recorder via Donna Allred and her agents have continued to conspire in corrupt business practices in support of the ultra-virus colorable criminal acts to obstruct justice and interfere in private commerce as recognized restraint of trade used as a weapon to discriminate based on religious free will and to conceal public records by witness tampering. Sacramento County agents doing business as de facto Sacramento County of are given judicial notice that California statutes provide that an officer forfeits his office upon concealment of records or by bona fide encumbrance to prevent further violations and warring against California and the United States Constitution laws and the laws of the United States and the laws of this state as well as the international treaties to engage in non-congressionally sanctioned acts of war to, against private protected civilians. The United States statutes at large mandate that whoever willfully and unlawfully conceals any record, paper, document, or other thing filed or deposited with any clerk or any public office is subject to fine or imprisonment, not more than three years or both. Whoever having the custody of any such record, document, paper, or other thing willfully and unlawfully conceals shall also forfeit his office and be disqualified from holding any office under the United States. And pro willful concealment of public records is a criminal act equivalent to an agent filing his or her resignation and immediate forfeiture from office and to be disqualified from holding any further office. And these are criminal acts reportable to the California Public uh, Anti-Public Corruptions Act commissions. And we will be filing complaints for each agent that continues to conceal these records through that agency to take care of this matter. Can you please wrap up your comments, ma'am? Thank you very much. Thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Hello. Good day. I'm calling from the Body Politics House of Yah, Yah's Real Estate Thrift Funds LLC to to condemn Sacramento County agents doing business de facto as the uh, Sacramento County, who continued since last Friday to willfully obstruct justice. The clerk recorder's office sanctioned by the Office of County Council and the Office of Board of Supervisors as standardized corrupt practices, leverages of the Office of the County Recorder to subvert the currency reporting requirements of Subchapter 2, Chapter 53 of Title 31. United States Code, commonly referred to as the Bank Secrecy Act. These corrupt businesses practices have been used to enable contraband smugglers and other criminals to leverage the office of the county recorder to engage in counterfeit side-by-side -side based businesses to avoid regulatory oversight and to evade taxes. These willful criminal acts are subject to cost schedule assessment and invoice at $100,000 per agent per day by every minister impacted since Friday, March 26, 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Hello? Yes, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. All right, good day. I'm calling from the body politic uh, the House of 
Yahweh Yazrael Estate Thrift Funds LLC to condemn Sacramento County agents doing business de facto as Sacramento County of, who continues since last Friday to willfully, by acts of violence and without consent, force the practice of law by interpretation and conclusion to prevent recordation of truths to facts to the official record, the clerk's recorder's office, sanctioned by the Office of the County Council and the Office of the Board of Supervisors as a standardized, standardized, standardized corrupt practice, denied the liberty to prevent using the office as conduit for the unlawful conversion of private exempt restricted cash items. This interpretation of the limited liability company act continues to allow chattel commercial secondary market counterfeit side-by-side -side collateral access devices used in fraud schemes by organized bulk cash smuggling enterprises. Concealment of records by these offices constitutes forfeiture from office while collecting a paycheck, an offense reportable to the California Fair P Political Practices Commission. These willful criminal acts are subject to cost schedule assessment and invoice at $100,000 per agent per day by every minister impacted since Friday, March 26, 2021. The international transportation into or out of the United States through the Sacramento County building as Sacramento County of trafficking in large amount monetary instruments in manners designed to circumvent the mandatory reporting provisions of subchapter two of chapter 53 of title 31 United States code is equivalent of and creates the same harm as the smuggling of goods. These willful criminal acts are subject to cost schedule assessment and invoice at $100,000 per agent per day by every minister impacted since Friday, March 26, 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Hello? Yes, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Oh, good day. My name is Renita Kendall. I'm calling from the Body Politics House of Yarrillville Estate Thrift Funds LLC to condemn Sacramento County agents doing business de facto as Sacramento County of uh, who continues since. I mean, sorry, the clerk recorder's office sanctioned by the office of the city, I mean, county council and board of the supervisors as a standardized corrupt practice leverages the office of the county recorder to subvert the currency reporting requirements of subchapter two, chapter 53 of title 31 United States code, commonly referred to as the Bank Secrecy Act. These corrupt business practices have been used to enable contraband smugglers and other criminals to leverage the office of the county recorder to engage in counterfeit side-by-side -side based businesses to avoid regulatory oversight and to evade taxes. These willful criminal acts are subject to call schedule assessment and invoice at 100,000 per agent per day by every minister in practice since Friday, March 26, 2021. Are you, are you done with your statement, ma'am? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, please send the next caller. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Yes, um, I can start now. Yes, please. Okay, good day. I'm calling from the Body Politic House of Yahweh Israel State Three Sons LLC to condemn willful criminal acts that are subject to cost schedule assessment and invoice of 100,000 per agent per day by every minister impacted since Friday, March 26, 2021. Sacramento County agents doing business de facto in Sacramento County of continues since last Friday to willfully interfere in private business and engage in corrupt practices reportable to the California Fair Political Practices Commission for willful omission to official duties for self-dealing to engage in criminal fraudulent conspiracy to deny recording truths related to smuggling operations taking place through the office of the county recorder. 
the intentional transportation into or out of the United States through the Sacramento County building, a Sacramento County of practicing in large amount monetary instruments and manners designed to circumvent the mandatory reporting provisions of subchapter 2 of chapter 53 of title 31, United States Code, is the equivalent of and creates the same harm as the smuggling of goods. Thank you. Thank you. Please send the, the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good day. I'm calling from the Body Politic, House of Yahweh, Yah Israel Estate Thrift Funds, LLC, to condemn Sacramento County agents doing business de facto as Sacramento County of, who continue since last Friday to willfully interfere in private business and engage in corrupt practices reportable to the California Fair Political Practices Commission for willful omission to official duties for self-dealing to engage in criminal, criminal fraudulent conspiracy to deny recording truths related to smuggling operations taking place through the office of the county recorder. The intentional transportation into or out of the United States through the Sacramento County building as Sacramento County of trafficking in large amount monetary instruments in manners designed to circumvent the mandatory reporting provisions of subchapter 2 of chapter 53 of title 31 United States Code is the equivalent of and creates the same harm as the smuggling of goods. These willful criminal acts are subject to cost schedule assessment and invoice at 100 per 100,000 per agent per day by every minister impacted since Friday, March 26, 2021. Good day. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Good day. Thanks for letting me talk. I'm calling from the Body Politic House of Yewa, Israel Estate Thrift Funds, LLC, to accept the forfeiture from office and to abate Sacramento County agents doing business de facto as Sacramento County of. That continued since last Friday to willfully interfere in private business and engage in corrupt practices reportable to the California Fair Pro Political Practices Commission for taking wages after forfeiture from office. Upon the decision to conspire and willfully obstruct justice for self-dealing to engage in criminal fraudulent conspiracy <coughs> to deny recordings under the color of authority, the acts equivalent each participant agent filling his or her resignation immediately forfeiture from office and disqualification from holding any office under the United States. Cost schedule billable at a rate of $100,000 per day per agent for each offense against a member. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. <laughs> Hi caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good day. I'm calling from the Body Politic, House of Yahweh, Israel, Estate Thrift Funds, LLC, to condemn Sacramento County agents doing business de facto as, as Sacramento County of, who continue since last Friday to willfully discriminate based on national origin or religious free will, which is a war crime punishable under treaty, by depriving private civilians the liberty to record pursuant to California Limited Liability Company Act. These willful criminal acts are subject to cost schedule uh, assessment and invoice at $100,000 per agent per day by every minister impacted since last Friday, March 26, 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, please transfer the last caller. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Yes. <clears throat> As a Sacramento County resident that's been following along to most of the Board of Supervisors meetings and the agenda items, I have a serious question and concern that I'd like to hear from each Board of Supervisor member of at what point do we prioritize racial and gender equity into all of these initiatives that we're talking about? Seeing that we have such a grave disparity on the racial impacts and the, the health impacts of so many of our folks, I, 
of color in our community that they're just disadvantaged and also um, low income, how are we prioritizing that the service metrics and the, the quality of service is ensured for every level of that? Um, I haven't heard anything in some of the, the proposals we've already heard today that's re referencing that. And then also, where does the accountability and the oversight come into for those conversations that happen? Where is it measurable at? I know behavioral health is going through a racial equity conversation, but that's just one department in a county that serves millions. I think we need to seriously consider that as we move forward in these discussions to look at that question and where does it exist to the community voice as well as all the stakeholders present. Typically in county systems, I'm seeing a repeated level of prioritization of law enforcement or county officials over those who are directly being served. And because it happens at such a high level, there's a, a gap in understanding of what's truly needed and how that's truly reflected in the services that are carried out. If we don't prioritize these types of options and, and looking at how do we measure and really dive into the racial equity conversation for every level of service, law enforcement, behavioral health, mental health, social services, then we're going to continue to fail the residents. I urge and urge and urge each Board of Supervisor to lift this question up as we're hearing about the alternatives to 911 and every other item on the, the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then please transfer the callers for item one. I'm going to have to jump off. I'm way behind. Hi. Caller, please start with your comments. Okay. The next caller. Please send the next caller, please, for item one. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Good morning. My name is Dr. Kareen McIntosh Sacco. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I own and operate a private practice in District 3, and I'm a resident of District 2. I'm part of the Mobilize for Mental Health Coalition, a group of 25 health professionals, community members, and social justice organizations that are advocating for an alternative to 911 response program for mental health crises and quality of life calls that does not involve law enforcement. The Board of Supervisors asked the community what it wanted from a 911 alternative, and it got a loud and clear answer. In fact, over 520 community members have signed on to a petition issuing the following demands, that this program operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that this program does not use funds from under-equipped health department budgets, that this program have an independent advisory board consisting of community members who are the real stakeholders, and that they have trained and experienced mental health professionals supporting peer specialists as the first responders to these crisis calls. Under the current plan being proposed, although it seems to lean heavily towards the 24-7 service delay delivery model, it's counting on using federal COVID dollars, and it's hoping to use proposed state funding that, if approved, would not even be available until July 2022. We can't afford to wait, and we can't pretend that 2020 didn't exist and won't have long-lasting negative impacts on people's mental health. With mental health distress on the rise due to COVID-19 pandemic, this response program is needed now more than ever. Under the current plan, there's an absence of an independent advisory board. In fact, the current plan seems to take most of its direction from law enforcement and an international consulting organization. We aren't reinventing the wheel here. And the county is planning to use less qualified mental health professionals. Not only is this a potential liability for the county, as it's employing professionals with not much real-world clinical experience to crisis calls, but it's also providing substandard care to those Can you most please wrap up your comments, ma'am? Yep, 
just a few more sentences. In my mind, this is reckless practice, as it's equivalent to having interns perform surgery unaccompanied. We need trained and experienced professionals. Also, Sacramento County and Maricopa County have very different racial demographics. Didn't the board just declare racism? Can you please wrap up your crisis? comments, please? I implore the board to delay voting on this matter. Have mm, thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Thank you. This is Dr. Dora Lee Grindler Katona. I'm calling to support the proposal for a 24 7 police free crisis hotline and mental health resources program. In my opinion, this is an extraordinary project that addresses the unfortunate statistic that one in four people shot and killed by police have mental illness. This is a sophisticated program that would provide 24-7, 365 days a year services for the Sacramento community that would intervene with skills to de-escalate conflict and communicate respect and trauma-based psychological skills to assess the help that is needed. It is a better solution than sustaining the methods offered by the police department. I urge you to vote in favor of this proposal and offer your trust in the black community who are sincerely and carefully trying to find much needed healing interventions for people in crisis. Thank you for listening. This is Dr. Dora Lee Grindler Katona. Thank you, doctor. Please send the next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Caller, can you hear me? Hi, caller, can you hear me? Okay, please send the next caller. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. PJ, District 1. I'm concerned that it appears the MH first wasn't contacted, but special priority was given to police chiefs when the community is literally asking for a removal of police from the process. You explicitly call police out for contact. Do you understand how you make folks crazy? Do you even have a fraction of a percent of introspection as to how this looks from the outside? One of the vestiges of white supremacy is bypassing those who have been doing the work if they happen to be women or minorities, saying, I am a white man with a white and primarily male power structure who knows how to do what you're doing, and I know how to do it better, despite not having done it, despite women and minorities literally having to create systems to help the marginalized because of the lack of proactive support from the city and the county. You do this when you walk past MH First volunteers who have been doing this work for over a year, who fill the void, and you pronounce me. I know how to do this better. I am the one who can do this. I don't need subject matter experts. I intrinsically have the knowledge needed to solve this. I am concerned that this comes along with a seeming lack of understanding of how police negatively impact tense situations, how just their presence, even if they were good at de-escalating, can immediately escalate a situation. I'm concerned because you see the data on mental health interactions being deadly with police. I'm concerned because you see the lack of any necessary police involvement in STAR and CAHOOT, and you effectively announce that you see no, no, no way forward without police involvement. Listen to the subject matter experts, listen to the community, listen to the freaking statistics. We need experts with years of experience in mental health. We need them to make the call on what they can or cannot de-escalate before some dipshit with a gun goes and kills someone because he perceived a hand movement or head nod as threatening. Having police on mental health calls makes about as much sense as having them oversee a pilot flying a plane. They don't know the controls. They don't know what fixes any problem being experienced. And their intuition and training teach them to perceive a threat and shoot first. How many people, people will be dead at the hands of police while we wait for the state implementation? We need this now. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Hi, my name is Joseph. Uh, first, I want to commend the board for voting against the jail expansion um, last 
recently. And I want to, I think we need to leverage that, that move and uh, encourage the continuation of not, not uh, encourage the continuation of not using law enforcement for mental health services. Um, as more calls are diverted from law enforcement, we will see less need for uh, sheriff's uh, work and for law enforcement response. And therefore, we don't need as much money going to their department and more money should be used uh, from, the, from their funds to uh, fund the alternative uh, 911 services um, and not uh, money from the public health services. Um, uh, I'm also concerned that the sheriffs are overly involved, uh, I believe, um, one of your speakers said it is imperative to have law enforcement or sheriff um, as they um, create this model, but uh, was less uh, a certain uh, of the need for community involvement. And I think it's imperative that we have community involvement and listen to the uh, listen to um, the black and brown communities that are most affected by law enforcement. Um, and so I just want to make sure that that those communities are being um, listened to throughout this process. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Yes. Uh, can you mute the meeting in the background while you're talking? Thanks. Okay, you can start with your comments now, please. Yes, good day. My calling is Adak Yazrael. Speaking on on the behalf of the uh, Commonwealth of Yahweh House of Yahweh, first I must edify all that the Reserve District Bank City of Sacramento County is non-conterminous with California State. So, whereas to explore funding options, determine if program impacts consent decree, and to look into federal legislative efforts is simple. Upon a consent decree delivered by an individual state adult entity, a U.S. person, a man, female and male, human capital stock certificate of participation or beneficial interest share in our common community from the people that shall be decentralized and individual receipts, which are always acknowledged for valuable consideration paid, are to be centralized with record of any security interest transaction to be recorded on the individual registrar state file number. Therefore, Laura Law or any other body politic law only deals with persons of unsound mind, but has no effect on man with dominion not in person, considered in room and in gross, a next to men municipal city of a county, which is a legal person of executives and administrators for man private property, which is also known as commercial paper or chattel paper property. So by definition, health is a sound state of mind that ought not be divided by any department or division of health, separating one sound state of mind. And I yield. Have a good day. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, can you start with your comments? You have two minutes. Law enforcement does not need, law enforcement does not, I repeat, does not need to be involved in this program. This program is needed because law enforcement kills people, kills community members suffering from mental health crisis kills community members for so many reasons that they don't need to be dead. Get law enforcement as far away from this as possible. They will only dilute the effectiveness, cause trauma and death, as they are not equipped with the knowledge, tools, skills, education, wherewithal, humanity, or common sense to handle these situations, as we have seen from the deaths of one in four. Sacramento Sheriff's statistics are abhorrent. Get law enforcement away from this. Listen to the people. Listen to your constituents. Next caller, um, please. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Yes, hello. My name is Brianca, and I would just like to say that we the people have witnessed time after time how the police have murdered civilians um, when encountering them. Um, in terms of mental health, I think that it's not a lot to ask that we take off some of their workload to prevent some of these deaths by investing into mental health. Um, considering that when they do murder people with mental health issues and stuff like that, and these cases get settled out through these families, um, the people are held accountable for these deaths because we're the ones paying for them, not the police. With a $4 million surplus, I think that it's wise for SAC PD to allow us to open up another um, organization in regards to mental health to one, take off some of their workload, to two, prevent some deaths, and for three, to put this type of job in the hands of someone more capable. Um, police are not mental health specialists. They have no business handling people with mental health issues or mental health crisis. And I think we could prevent a lot of innocent people going to jail and a lot of innocent deaths if we could just put the money where it goes. Um, seeing how they keep asking for more money with the $4 million surplus, I don't see why it's um, even a question to do this, but um, I think the more we get pushed back on this from you guys, um, the more we start questioning everyone in city council. We just want to live and we want people to live. We're people who really care about people. And if they can't pr protect and serve everyone, then perhaps they shouldn't be in control of certain issues. And, and so I think that they should invest that money somewhere else. It should be reallocated in something else. I don't think that the police should still be able to keep that money and retain that money that they're not using um, to do a job they don't do well and a job they can't handle clearly. We want to live. So that's all I had to say. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Stevie Cook, and I'm a resident of District 1. I'm reaching out today to let you know that I support the Board of Supervisors' decision to fund a 911 alternatives program for community members experiencing mental health crises that is completely independent of any law enforcement influence. This governing body is moving in the right direction by seeking more depth from staff on this type of programming. Hold on a sec, baby. Hold on. Um, I urge you to not get distracted. This 911 alternative programming must remain independent of the sheriff. I repeat, 911 alternatives must be independent of law enforcement, which means there must be a separate XXX number staffed by experts in mental health, not staffed by those pipelining people into incarceration. <laughs> Concerned and caring members of the public need to know they can reach out with ease for expert assistance from trained counselors, therapists, and other health workers who are going to de-escalate rather than incarcerate neighbors who are going through complex emotional and physical hardships. This new number could literally be a lifeline. Teams of knowledgeable mental health experts paired with peers must be the point of first contact for mental health crisis response. Additionally, this program will not be robust and effective unless you fully fund it as a 24-7, 365 budget item. This the $15 million being advocated for by the frontline emergency volunteers who've been on the ground doing this work is the minimum amount that should be allotted, considering it's a tiny slice of the horrendous legal fees county law enforcement officers already cost our community. Members of the board, you have the opportunity here to make this a successful and permanent outreach asset in our county not just a performative trial. As you have heard many times before from your constituents, your budget is your value, so fund 911 alternatives from a reallocated law enforcement budget. Take a stand against the old guard punitive ways and you will be truly visionary. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi caller, please start with your comment. You have two minutes. Yes, um, my name is Kula Koenig, and I'm a resident of District 3, which Desmond's district. Um, regarding this item, I just want to say that, echoing what the last caller said, alternatives to 911 means something that is without law enforcement involved, because an alternative is something different. 
Um, so law enforcement should not have their hands in this. Um, I would request that one of the supervisors, so my supervisor, Rich Desmond, to see how the alternatives to 911 community feedback sessions and all the hundreds of public comment were taken into consideration when this proposal was developed because I'm not seeing it. So I just want to make sure that all the time that people put in to go to those um, sessions that Bruce Wagstaff staff were not taking in vain. So Supervisor Desmond, please um, ask to see that. Um, we also uh, need a champion or fighter because uh, for this, because this is going against the grain and the path of least resistance is not going to get us there. So Supervisor Natoli, thank you once again for asking the great questions. You will be missed when you retire. Um, you know, I keep thinking about the last meeting, I think it was the end of February when staff brought this up and we were like, okay, let's, let's make this happen. And then it said, okay, well, actually, let's go back and, and do some more research and see what happens if we have 8, 16, and 24 hours even though you've been working on it in September. And I was like, why isn't this done? Um, so now staff is like, Bruce is like, okay, we can go back and look at that um, regarding some of the points that Supervisor Natoli brought up. Like, why are we slow walking this? That's what bothers me about all of this is when proposals are pushed forward, it's the floor. And that's what we keep pushing. Um, that's what, and then we have to keep pushing from meeting to meeting to get more. Just like the Community Review Commission, again, you propose a floor and then we have to keep pushing for more. Why not the reverse? As a citizen of Sacramento, I'm frustrated that there's a lack of urgency on these issues. Who tells staff that something is urgent? Let's get it done. It's the slow walking for me, and it needs to stop because people are dying. I know that government can move when they want to. I'm reminded of recently when we had the storms and the severe weather, and at first the city of Sacramento was saying, we can't do anything, we don't have the money. And after can you please wrap up was, your comments, and there was please? Uproar, sure, I'm almost done. After people died and there was uproar, all of a sudden we have shelters open 24-7. So it's just about priorities, and it will also be a slap in the face if the money to fund this does not come from law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Good morning. Yes, I'm calling this morning, um, and I'm excited to hear that it sounds like this is going to be moving forward, but I just wanted to say that I understand the desire to maintain the safety of publicly fun funded employees, but I think it's just as important to maintain the safety of the public. And um, I wanted to add that the House of Representatives did just pass an act on March 3rd that would end qualified immunity for police officers, among other things. So there is a change coming in uh, the way that our society is going to be engaged and we should not be investing $405.8 million of a $2.78 billion budget to criminalizing our citizens. So I'm really looking forward to this program moving forward and to the county supporting it to engage the full county and not just the unincorporated or certain parts of the county. Thank you. Have a nice day. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments, and you have two minutes. Hello, my name is Susan Gallagher, and I'm the executive director of Cal Voices. Uh, while we overwhelmingly support alternatives to 911 responders, we struggle to support this program in its current form for the following reasons. It appears obvious that the program will eventually utilize MHSA funds, yet the program was developed outside of the community planning process and behind closed doors. There was no vetting of the creation of the Alternatives to 911 program or the development of the Behavioral Health Care Specialist class classification which accompanies it before either the MHSA Steering Committee or the Mental Health Advisory Board. You state clearly that it's a mental health response team. But yet, the mental health community is really absent from any of the discussions. Um, this violates the Welfare and Institution Code related to the use of MHSA funds, as there are very clear standards that must be followed in order to fund any program with MHSA funds. Even after listening to all the comments today, I still don't see how this program is going to be funded, and it's, it's really unclear. And it's not something that you go back and shoehorn into a public process after you guys have created a program behind, the, behind closed doors. The public has a right to know about this program. A lot of work has gone on since September, and yet it still hasn't been brought to the public. I also wanted to mention that there is legislation for a 988 line, which could assist with some of the funding, but you still need a match. 
and that match most likely will be realignment or MHSA funding. Either way, it's got to go through the MHSA process or the Mental Health Advisory Board. Both of those things are what we have in place in the mental health community, and neither has been consulted about this program. Number two, individuals who have personally experienced a mental health crisis only represented 25% of all listening session participants. Additionally, participant demographics re reflect substantial underrepresentation of various communities of color who really need this program desperately, as you've heard today. The community has been crying out to defund a portion of law enforcement's budget in order to create this program. Yet, you don't even talk about the funding, but we don't. Know, we all know that it's not going to be law enforcement funding. In fact, you really wanted to defund our advocacy program that has been in operation for 27 years in order to fund the behavioral health care specialists. All, again, outside of the public view. Is Sacramento County going to open Can the front door to crisis Can you please wrap up your comments? Services? Yes, if this program is going to take place, it needs to have a front door. The Mental Health Treatment Center hasn't taken any clients since COVID started. It, there it, is, it is not accessible by the front door. And even though Mr. Hunt mentioned budget cuts to Can it, you please we still give it $30 million please? a year. $30 million a year, and it's not accessible by the public. There, is, there needs to be shared power in decision-making and Thank development. Thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Osama Muqaddam, and I'm the Policy and Advocacy Manager for the Sacramento Valley Chapter of the Council on American-Islamic Relations. I'm here today to speak on Agenda Item 1, emphasize the many concerns that have been voiced as it relates to emergency response by law enforcement, and urge the County Board of Supervisors to reallocate funding from the Sheriff's budget surplus in order to increase the proposed program budget to $15 million. We have seen the level of community response over the past year as it relates to implementing community-led emergency programs. Even the Sheriff's Department publicly expressed that it isn't well equipped to adequately handle emergency situations that involve people who are suffering from a mental health crisis. It's critical that we shift that respons responsibility in conjunction with the funding that has been allocated to the Sheriff's Department to handle those situations into community-led programs. Similarly, these community-led emergency response programs should operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When talking about emergency services, especially as they relate to mental health crises, we should equip our county with the funds that are ne and necessary resources to offer these services around the clock. Again, I urge you to support the proposed community-led 24-7 mental health crises, crisis response system and include it in the county's fiscal budget for, 20, for the 2021-2022 calendar year with an increase in allocation from $1.5 million to $15 million. Thank you. Thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lisa Campos, and I am calling to demand that we seek funding for mental health alternatives and that we take that funding from the sheriff's budget um, so that we can prevent um, more lives being taken. Um, Are you still there, ma'am? Hello, it was muted. Um, in order to avoid um, more murders at the hands of the police, um, such as the shooting of Adam Lent, um, Gabby Navarez, um, also um, Maurice Hawley, um, and many others, and it puts families in the position to have to decide to call for help um, at the possibility of their family members being murdered at the hands of police. Um, currently, there are no other alternatives. And it is completely um, negligent of the of the city and the county to not fund mental health alternatives from the police budget. I'm um, considering that they murder people that need help. Um, considering that the community is then left to pay the price, the cost for the, the settlement of these murders, while the police still roam our streets and are not equipped to be able to deal with mental health crises um, or people in need. Um, it is definitely the city and the county's responsibility to be sure that families have other alternatives and that we are not in a position to wonder if the lives of our loved ones are going to be taken when we, when we need help for them. Um, 
it, it is negligent and, and it is disgusting that we are still talking about this years after people have been killed repeatedly, um, after we have substantial proof that the police are not equipped to handle this, um, years after we have substantial proof that there's other alternatives and things that are more effective for our community. Um, it, I just, I urge you to do the right thing and to, to be responsible and to be an example. We are, we are the capital of the state. We make laws. We, um, can you please wrap up your everywhere? comments, ma'am? Yes, yes. Do the right thing. It is, it is our responsibility. It is an insult to the community to not fund it out of the police budget or out of the sheriff's budget. This needs to be done now, and there should not be any other excuses. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Hi, my name is Celeste, and I am a community member from District 1. Um, and it was brought up earlier in the meeting, but I think it's really crucial, um, and there's been a lack of discussion around wraparound services. Um, we really need to consider what leads to crisis, a lack of mental health services, but also a lack of access to things such as food and housing, uh, which are conditions that can exacerbate mental health issues. I think it's also important to view this mobile crisis unit as a link, um, but it's also important to consider what we're linking to. We know that mental health services are inadequate, which is why we're here having this conversation. And I think a 911 alternative necessarily involves creating and sustaining robust mental health programs. I'm also concerned that the plan as it stands does still heavily involve law enforcement, which is something that the community has called for time and time again um, for less law enforcement involvement. And also Laura's law was brought up during this meeting, um, which seems like um, it is a consideration, but also a consideration that would enhance that law enforcement involvement and also the involvement of the carceral state. And the community is really looking to avoid, obviously, the interference of law enforcement and to also avoid compulsory enforced mental health treatment, which has a history of carceral state interaction. We're looking to expand access, not to control behavior and force treatment. I also think it's important to consider that preventing and interrupting crisis is actually cheaper in the long term than criminalizing crisis. So considering these alternatives is a great step forward. But we also need to base these interventions in intentionally decriminalizing mental health crisis. I'd also like to uplift the demands of our local community organizations, a sustainable 24-7 program, not a pilot, at least the $4 million sheriff surplus to fund these programs. Can you please wrap up your comments, please? Yes, an independent advisory board involving key stakeholders. Um, and I also would like to mention to the board that we sit here and debate about money, um, but I think it's important to consider the value of human life and also the value of the human lives of the folks lost to inappropriate police responses. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Hello, I'm calling from County District 1 with Sacramento Act. As one of your constituents, I appreciate that you are all eager to consider this much needed program. As elected officials, we hold you to a higher standard and expect you to set community programs up for success. This means expanding the program to operate 24 seven with an independent advisory board and increased funding pooled from the sheriff's budget. I also challenge you to shift your perspective regarding law enforcement's involvement in this program. I know many of you are concerned with the aspect of safety should police not be involved. I ask you to instead think about the aspect of danger should police actually be involved. We have seen so many of our community members murdered by Sacramento law enforcement. Are you asking for the same sheriff officers who in response to a mental health call stated there's some nut tweak just freaking out if you see him hit him with a baseball bat a couple of times. That's a quote from the Sacramento Sheriff Officer. If you push for law enforcement involvement and they kill another one of our community members, how will you feel then knowing that you pushed for this? You can prevent another tragedy by listening to the alternatives that community is providing. Approving this lackluster proposal will be ignoring the voices of those who are most vulnerable and impacted by this issue, as well as the hundreds of public comments and petition signatures. Again, to echo earlier comments, alternative means no law enforcement. 
say their names, Justin Prescott, Maurice Hawley, Wallace Jory, Dazion Flano, Gabby Navarez, Adam Lunt, Robert Coleman, Mike McIntyre, Daryl Richard, Joseph Mann, Jordan Zenka. Supervisors, I am asking that you don't add another name to this list. Go look outside your office and see the pictures our children have drawn about what makes them feel safe. Look at how they drew families, communities, not guns and cops. Daryl Richards was a child, a child experiencing a mental health crisis. Don't put any more of our children at risk, please. Again, we desperately need this program, but we need it done right. I encourage the board members to vote with your morals today. You have an opportunity to save lives. At the very least, please consider this community input and delay voting on this matter. Your constituents are watching and expecting you to do what is right. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have. Can you uh, can you mute the meeting in the background, please? Yes. Okay. Can and, you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead and start now. You have two minutes. Sure. Uh, Greetings, County Su uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, calling in from District One, and I want. Uh, I just want to raise a key question that I'm getting from this presentation. Why are Jim Hunt and DHS staff taking any cues on 911 alternatives from deep red states like Arizona, Texas, and Georgia? You know, it seems like I really appreciate uh, several supervisors, uh, Natoli, Serna, and Kennedy, uh, st like standing up and, and asking the critical questions that need to be asked of staff uh, presentations right now because it seems like they're completely reinventing the wheel from the cahoots and star model that's been discussed uh, for the past six months, uh, all for the sake of basically catering to law enforcement's feelings uh, to allow them to retain significant input and control over this process. So I want to spell this out loud and clear. Fuck law enforcement's feelings. We need to quit putting cost savings over community needs. We need people to actually like stand up and demand a 24-7 program that is comprehensive as of to what community needs, not what law enforcement wants. We do not need sheriff or city police advice on how to develop a 911 alternative for mental health crisis. We need an independent advisory board, such as mental health advisory board, the PHAB board, to review and advise the program's development. We do not need mental health specialists to co-locate within police controlled dispatch centers. We need an independent phone number and call center until 988 is funded. Police don't heal us, they kill us. Law enforcement created this crisis so we can't depend upon them to fix it. No 911 dispatch, no in officer involvement. We need this board to demand a program led by peers that support, like, with the support of clinicians, not the other way around. Heart attacks don't wait until 9 a.m., nor do mental health crises. We need this program to be funded 24-7. And most importantly, we need more than just $10 million to really put, like, put this program into perspective. $10 million is pennies compared to the hundreds of millions of dollars that we already put Can you please into wrap up your the comments, sir? Departments. And we also and into the lawsuits that we pay because they do not know or even care to know how to respond humanely or compassionately to mental health crisis. We need this program to be fully funded, and there's plenty of money to do it. That money isn't the issue. You know where to take it from. It can come from the sheriff. It can come from a con like the construction contract around the jail expansion. There are plenty of places you can bring it from. Can you please wrap up your comments? Thank you. I appreciate you all asking the critical questions that are necessary. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Can you hear me? Caller, can, can you, you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead and start with your comments. You have two minutes. Good morning. My name is Andrea Crook, and I am the Director of Advocacy for Access California. And I have two comments. Um, one, I'd like to um, take off my, my formal hat and just address you as a um, concerned citizen. Um, I have not been tuning in to these meetings, and to see um, Chair Frost not wearing a mask is incredibly disheartening um, as an individual who um, lost a, a very dear loved one. My children lost their grandmother due to COVID. Um, it 
we hold you to a higher standard and for you to not be role modeling for community, um, just no words. Um, please wear a mask, save lives, and set an example. Um, also, I wanted to address the conversation around AOT. Um, under this law, counties are required to divert critical mental health resources to AOT programs, regardless of the actual community needs and despite the unprecedented challenges they face from COVID. AOT is antithetical to the recovery model and prioritizes the very fail-first approach California voters rejected when we passed MHSA in 04. I know this wasn't on the agenda. I don't believe that um, we should even be talking about it, but because it was brought up, I felt compelled to um, let you know that, you know, we recommend that you opt out. Additionally, um, currently Sacramento has no front door for law enforcement and waiting times for outpatient services are 45 days. So it takes away local county control to divert funds to what we um, feel are, are the most pressing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next caller, please. I call her. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Or can you, hello, can you mute the meeting in the background? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, you have two minutes. Please start with your comments. Okay. Hello, my name is Meg White, and I am with District 1 uh, with Phil Cerna. I own a business and a home in this district, and I, as well as all of my other black, brown, and poor community members, deserve a 911 emergency response alternative that we can actually rely on for mental health crisis and quality of life calls. I'm really frustrated that my local politicians are value valuing the feelings of law enforcement over the needs of the community. The plan the city has brought back is completely unacceptable and does not reflect the needs of the, the community. There are plenty of things for the sheriff to do outside of mental health crisis and quality of life calls. The Sac Sheriff in particular is 50% more violent than any other sheriff in the state, and suffering from a mental health crisis makes you 16 times more likely to be murdered by the sheriff or by law enforcement. Scott Jones has already stated he'd like to get out of the homeless response business completely, and taxpayers are paying millions of dollars in wrongful death suits every year because of murders done by the sheriff during mental health crisis. Programs like Cahoots and Denver Star, as well as Mental Health First Oakland, are already saving money and lives. I cannot for the life of me understand why law enforcement and the Board of Supervisors wouldn't be more than happy to meet the demands of the community that's been echoed by the Mobilized for Mental Health Coalition. We need a 24-7 program. We need something fully funded with $14 million coming from the sheriff's surplus as well as what's not going to be used on the jail expansion. We need no law enforcement involvement as well as an independent advisory board. The city is so out of touch with their needs. I would like them to reach out to Mental Health First, Dr. Seiko, as well as the Homeless Union, and for the board to do the right thing to take two more weeks and come back with a program that actually reflects the demands of the community. The police being involved here inherently makes this not an alternative by definition. It's time to stop criminalizing mental health emergencies, save money, and save lives by allowing mental health professionals to handle mental health emergencies. I'd like to use the rest of my, not, my time. Can you to please wrap up your comments? Yes, absolutely. Of the people who have been murdered during a mental health crisis by law enforcement, like Adam Lund, Gabby Navarez, Michelle Shirley, Maurice Holly, Justin Prescott, Walter Jolery, Robert Coleman, Daryl Richard, Joseph Mann, and Elijah McLean. Thank you, and please. Sorry about that. Um, please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. My name is Cindy McCullough. I'm a board certified behavior analyst, and I own a behavioral health care clinic serving residents of Sacramento County. I'm writing today, or calling today, to request that the Board of Supervisors vote to support fully funding of a 24 7 mental health care alternative to 911 that does not involve police. I primarily service members of the community that are significantly impacted by autism spectrum disorder. Many of my patients are nonverbal and oftentimes are unable to follow one-step verbal directions, making encounters with law enforcement extremely dangerous. 
We've had patients go AWOL from their homes throughout the years, engage in very dangerous self-injurious behaviors that have resulted in concussions and contusions and other bodily injury, and engage in huge meltdown behaviors in public places because their senses has, have just become overloaded. In each of these instances, the families that I served are absolutely terrified to call the police, especially my families of color. Sometimes these families attempt to manage extremely dangerous behaviors on their own because they believe that involving the police will result in their child or loved one's arrest, further bodily harm, or even their child's death. Families affected by severe autism are desperate for alternatives to 911 that do not involve the police. They need 24-7 access to mental health and behavioral health personnel that are specifically trained and certified in crisis prevention and intervention services that can provide trauma-informed care and are adequately trained to meet their communication needs. On January 15, 2021, a teen with autism in Louisiana was killed by a, a deputy after the deputy sat on the child for nine minutes. This is after the parents called the police for help because their child was having an unsafe behavior in a parking lot. These types of meltdown behaviors are really common with those that are impacted significantly by autism, and they should absolutely not result in death. There Can you please wrap up instances. your comments? There are countless other instances that I can mention today that I will not do to the constraints of time. However, sending police in lieu of mental and behavioral health care professionals that literally have thousands of accrued supervised hours of service before they're, continue, they're considered can you qualified please wrap up your to obtain their licensure, it's unfair and unsafe to expect for police to provide adequate emergency care to individuals in a mental health care crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Okay. Hello. This is Mache. Uh, good morning to everybody but Sue Frost. Uh, I strongly urge this body to implement a 24-7 mental health crisis response team. That is completely separate from law enforcement, just like at least a dozen of these callers had already mentioned, but hopefully you listen to us this time. Um, there have been countless mental health-related murders from police officers that directly target uh, black and brown communities, and I'm speaking straight from experience. Um, my father, Donald Venerable, was murdered from uh, Sacramento Police in 2001, to, uh, 20 years ago, um, for calling 911 um, because the police officers thought the cell phone that he used was a gun and they, she shouldn't have to call um, law, enforce, law enforcement in the first place, but unfortunately that was the case. Um, so definitely uh, urge this body to uh, implement a program that is um, totally and utterly separate from um, police officers and, and law enforcement um, and to give more than $1.5 million um, to this so it's not a pilot program and so that it's a sustainable program um, and uh, to have an independent advisory board um, that is um, again, completely separate from law enforcement because we we don't need any interference from police officers um, as they are harmful to uh, to uh, black and brown communities as you know and in the Sacramento community. Um, and let's see. Yeah, I mean, that's all I have right now. Um, but hopefully you uh, take into consideration, not even consideration, but you actually listen to all the public comments because they are very uh, consistent with our messages, and especially from those community forums that y'all posted that um, obviously aren't being taken into consideration also since um, we're still having conversations with um, the SAC sheriff. Can you please wrap up your comments? Uh, with the SAC sheriff. Uh, and they're still having conversations with sac sheriffs in uh, implementing this uh, mental health um, crisis team. We don't want any. Inter we don't want any um, any partnerships with law enforcement. So leave them out. Um, and yeah, uh, have a good day. Except for Sue Frost, because you don't wear masks. Thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Yes, my name is Ryan McClinton, public health advocate, and also with the MHSA County Steering Committee. 
Um, I'm calling because I'm recognizing that as we're talking about this alternatives to mental health plan, we're still not hearing any conversation about what does accountability and oversight look like in, to, in terms of ensuring that equity and the quality of service is landing where it needs to. We have a conversation that is now shifted because of the inclusion of law enforcement, which we recognize as a shift from 911, so there has to be some level of engagement. However, that doesn't mean that equity looks like law enforcement's voice being prioritized over those of the community stakeholders and so many of the professionals you've heard calling in so far today. You've heard from mental health professionals, you've heard from peer support specialists, you've heard from those who are directly impacted, as well as county staff that all recognize there's a need for these services to truly be invested in in tangible ways that truly live in the equity that's needed and that's needed to be supported. How are we measuring those things? Who's, who's being accountable? Is there going to be an advisory board that's made up primarily of community stakeholders? mental health professionals and paramedicine folks who can actually staff these, these vans versus law enforcement being the predominant board voice that voids and often um, cancels out so many of the recommendations that you're hearing brought forth. I think one other thing that you can look at in terms of what's a model that you can um, review to see how can this be carried forward in terms of how we're prioritizing the voice of community stakeholders is in Ithaca, New York. Their county administrator has openly acknowledged that too often we have these community listening sessions where law enforcement's voice is prioritized and they actually have veto power over the recommendations that come forward from community stakeholders. This is our opportunity as a county to get it right and actually move forward in the right direction. We also heard earlier from other commenters that there is a need for, again, asking the questions of where does equity exist and lying daily for these programs and these systems, especially the carceral system. I think, again, it would behoove the Board of Supervisors to truly ask those questions and make sure that there's a body made up of community stakeholders that can actually review the direction of this program, the success rates, and also what does it mean to continue to, to grow in that area of improvement. It is an ongoing conversation, and I understand this Can you is the please wrap up your comments, sir? I, I can. Okay. <laughs> if we're going to build this right, we need to build it right with intention from the, from the get-go. So recognizing where equity exists at and where it doesn't, and the disparities are at, that's where we have to start this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Good morning. My name is Kenny, and I'm calling from District 5. I'm calling to urge the board to meet the demands of the Mobilized for Mental Health Coalition. Law enforcement is not qualified or compassionate enough to respond to mental health crisis calls, and they lack the expertise and training to even be included in the process of developing alternatives to law enforcement response to mental health crises. To remind you, the demands of the Mobilized for Mental Health Coalition include a sustainable 24-7 program, funding from the $4 million sheriff's surplus, as well as using the $10 million that will not be used for jail expansion, an independent advisory board, and no police interference. Trained and unarmed mental health responders pose the least threat to people experiencing mental health crises because they're trained to be effective while being the least confrontational so as not to escalate the situation. Just the presence of police often escalates the situation and triggers trauma in those already experiencing a crisis. Police treat those in crisis like criminals and inflict more trauma. I've personally witnessed SAC PD respond to a mental health patient in the most cold and callous way, not showing any care or compassion for the man they should have been there to help. Their mere presence was an unnecessary escalation and they refused a trained mental health worker's request to allow them to speak with and help the man. Back in September, Sheriff Scott Jones said himself that he would support alternative options for mental health and unhoused response. That's all the input the Sheriff's Department should get in this process. Sacramento citizens deserve a safe and compassionate 24-7 mental health crisis response team, and we're depending on you, the board, to hear the demands and do what is right. Lastly, hearing the always unmasked Sue Frost refer to any citizen as a burden on the system both disgusts me and shows her clear lack of compassion and understanding and highlights her inability to understand mental health issues and the effect they, ha the effect they have on those suffering from them. And hearing her every sigh and yawn is both offensive and obnoxious. Support the demands of the Mobilized Mental Health Coalition and get rid of Sue Frost. Put on a mask. Thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. This matter brings to memory the declaration by Peter Burnett, California's first governor, who declared the extermination of all the Tatian and indigenous people to this land. 
and Chair Sue Frost demonstrate uh, mental disorders by her speech and actions of a person whose thinking is confused. We are required to wear masks, and as the earlier caller stated, she still hasn't put her mask on. She operates in defiance of the law. She overthrows the laws, and she's not operating in a manner. She asks in previous sessions for a list of agencies that discriminate or have racist policies, and she should be at the top of that list because the mental illness and disorders that we have experienced are due directly to state sanctions and created crisis. This is due to your legislative actions. You're participating in genocidal war crimes because to remind you all, the 10 stages of genocide begins with the classification and then the symbolization by branding to discriminate and dehumanize through organized polarization and preparation to persecute, which is what's happening. The persecution is what's led to this mental illness for the extermination by murder and civil death and then to deny. So Supervisor Chair Frost says she denies that racism exists. She denies that we are in, in a place where we have these things happening and she denies that every place in Sacramento, we have the most segregated schools and the most segregated communities in this state and in this nation. So we need to take a look at the underlying reasons why we have mental disorders and to look and see who actually has the mental disorders based on their actions and based on their speech because they contradict each other. So when you have a policy that you're setting for those who are mentally disabled, we need to make sure we have those who are competent at following and being compliant with the law before they go and institute any further program that are going to further exacerbate the furtherance of the discrimination and the mental illnesses due to the torture and torment, genocidal war crimes, I yield. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Hi, this is Thomas, District 4. We need you to consider the health and well-being of those experiencing mental health crises first and foremost, not budget, people, not police funding or defunding, people. People matter, at least they should matter, and your views and your votes on this matter are what will tell us how you view their importance. Yes, on a robust, knowledgeable, experienced mental health team with the tools and funding necessary to be successful and a complete lack of police involvement, except in the evidentially rare situations where a mental health professional with years of experience specifically says, I cannot handle this situation. Yes, on a community-based advisory board. Yes, on a program led by peers and supported by clinicians. No to any of this is a no to all of it. All pieces are needed to make this function, and to act like they aren't necessary is kneecapping the program at the outset. Please don't play lip service. Please don't make grand gestures. Please just ensure that this can be successful and has the staffing and people to ensure that it, that happens. With 988 coming down the pipe, it's inevitable, and it would serve us well to act as, as an example in this state, and as Cahoots and as Star have done in their respective states. We need to build on their legacies, not dismantle their progress through timid actions and weak-willed half-measures. Please have strength and assuredness of your moral duty to help those in crisis. And lastly, a few weeks back, you had $10 million to help fulfill a handful of the requirements of the consent decree. Now you have the potential to do much more. I would hope you would see that that $10 million is easily justifiable to use here to add to other funding to make this a success. The fix for police mishandling of mental health crises isn't police continuing to handle mental health, mental health crises, only in a slightly reduced capacity. I honestly thought this would be common sense for y'all. Stop giving police priority. They are stakeholders. Less calls means less funding for them, so they have a vested interest in running calls through them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Okay, good morning, my name, Board of Supervisors. My name is Yesenia Sandoval. Uh, my family and I own a home here in the Northgate community. As a community member and a board woman of color, I am a strong advocate for more mental health services. The Sacramento Sheriff has a history of dividing up our communities and cause more harm than good when they intervene. I have lived in the Foothill Farms area as well as in the Citrus Heights area where my parents owned their home and I grew up. We were afraid of calling the cops. Our community needs mental health services desperately in order to heal from the historical racist and divisive sheriff's department. In addition, I'm calling for more funding for mental health that is led by local community activists and professionals, as well as keeping law enforcement away from this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next caller, please.
Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Hi, my name is B, and um, I've noticed this board seems more concerned with the health of the state rather than the health of its constituents from which it withholds funds from. You have the money, so much time has passed, and so many have died. This is not the first meeting the group Mental Health First has been mentioned, but the board neglects the incredible amount of care put into and given by Mental Health First. Rather than looking to attune to the needs of the people under your authority, you would rather attune to the needs of law enforcement, uh, who has repeatedly and consistently caused trauma to the community. By trying to keep bringing in police, you hurt your own cause. Stop this. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller, please start with your comments and you have two minutes. Hello, I'm calling from the Black Saver Impact team to share stories of your constituents who could not be here today to share their stories themselves because your law enforcement has killed them. Gabby Navarez, a 22-year-old young mother with a mental illness, was fatally shot 7 to 20 times by police in March of 2014 by Citrus Heist Police. Her grandmother had called the police to report her vehicle was sto stolen. When police tracked the vehicle that was given, what, that was driven by Gabby, she invaded, she invaded them by driving at high speeds. She was killed. Jordan Vinka, a 26-year-old self-described chronically houseless gay man, was overcoming addiction and trauma of abusive relationships, was shot and killed by police in December of 2020 in Atomas, Bel Air, of, off of Arena Boulevard. Joseph Mann was an unhoused man with a history of mental illness. When he did not comply with officers' loudspeaker commands, officers intentionally tried to hit Mann with their patrol vehicle, stating, we'll get him. The same officers then exited the vehicle and pursued Mann on foot, shooting him 14 times. Daryl Richards, a 19-year-old man, was fatally shot by SAC PD in 2018 while experiencing a mental health crisis. Officers responding to a 911 call asked about a masked man brandishing a gun. Richards was found hiding under a stairwell, hiding under a stairwell, a child, in a surrender position with his palms open. He had recently stated to display signs of mental illness, such as paranoia and uncharacteristic aggression and he was scheduled for a mental health evaluation. Adam Lunt, 24-year-old man, was shot and killed by West Sac County police officer after a person called police to report a man holding a knife and reported that he saw him stab himself in the neck. When the officers approached him, Prescott allegedly charged toward them, so they shot him. It remains unknown what led to the shooting, only that Lunt exited the vehicle prior to the shooting. Can you please Video wrap up footage. your comments, please? Yes, yes. Speaking of people, your constituents who have died, video footage showed Lent holding a gun and a knife. However, the gun was later determined to be a pellet gun. Justin Prescott, a 30-year-old man, was shot and killed by Sac County Sheriff deputies after he was seen inside a Walmart cutting tags off a merchandise with a comments? pocket knife. Are you going to cut me off from speaking about the dead life, the black thank, life? Thank, thank you for so your comments. Okay, next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Hello. Good uh, Good afternoon. My name is Adnan. I live in Supervisor Kennedy's district, District 2. Uh, it is incredibly important that we have alternatives to police response in Sacramento. Police are not safe for residents of this county, and they need to not be involved in this alternative. The rampant patterns of violence and abuse that the police have shown is unacceptable and they need to be divested from. We need no 911 dispatch and no officer involvement. Met mental health crisis responses need 24-7 compassionate care and the police do not provide this. The funding needed for alternative responses is nothing compared to what we pay in lawsuits on behalf of the sheriff. They are a waste of money and they treat our communities in inhumane ways. We have everything to gain as a people by funding 
existing alternatives to police response. This conversation needs to center the people who are on the receiving end of violence and who are in need of care. It should not involve the people who are trying to exert control over these communities with their carceral violence. The police in this county have made it abundantly clear that they view us as subhuman from the way they speak about and murder us. Maurice Holly, Joseph Mann, Daryl Richards, Justin Prescott, Wallace Jory, Daisy Antonell, Gabri Gabby Navarez, Adam Lunt, Robert Coleman, and Michael McIntyre are just a few of many more who I haven't named who would all still be alive if it weren't for Sacramento area police. This is a matter of immediate safety and more people will die if we do not act to remove police contact as much as possible and put police funding toward programs that actually help people. We already have community organizations like MH First. They just need funding and you can provide that, which means you can save lives so that we don't have to keep adding names to this list. Thank you, and please make the choices that are truly best for Sacramento safety. Thank you. Next caller, please. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Hello. I'm calling to reiterate the, reiterate the importance of having a compassionate and effective 24-7 mental health crisis team to address mental health crisis calls. On December 22, 2004, my brother Ronnie Pino, who suffered from epilepsy since the age of nine, was taken to Heritage Oaks Hospital where he was seeking treatment for his hallucinations that were brought on by medicine prescribed by his physician. He grew agitated because they locked the doors and would not let him go outside to smoke a cigarette. He broke their window to escape and the cops were called. The cops were confrontational, jittery people, untrained in how to deal with a person as disturbed as my brother. Instead of talking to him, they did everything wrong. And what is absolutely heartbreaking is that the officers ignored my mother's plea to take him to the hospital after tra tasering him twice. He had a vagus nerve stimulator implant and she knew the shots from the taser was going to hurt him. Instead, they threatened to tase her, a 62-year-old woman, and then proceeded to take him straight to jail where he received no medical treatment nor his prescribed medicine. He later died alone inside his cell. My brother was not a criminal. He had no prior record of any crime in his 31 years of life. He was a 31-year-old Hispanic mentally challenged man with the mind of a 12-year-old boy. I remember growing up a few times the Sacramento and county sheriff would, were called out to our home because my brother had these fits, you know, he was, he's epileptic and he would get frustrated. And they always knew how to talk to my brother. They always talked him down. And by the end of the, of the call, he was out in their sheriff's car squad and they were showing him all the lights and bells and whistles. But Can you please wrap up your comments, ma'am? But I believe that these professionally trained, um, I believe that if there was professionally trained mental health professionals that day, my brother may be still be alive. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, I caller. Please that. start with your comments. You have two minutes. And could you mute the meeting in the background, please? Um, mute the meeting in the background? Okay. I can't hear myself if you do that. Okay. Okay. And could you start with your comments? You have two minutes. Thank you. Good day. This is an extraordinary situation. I'm calling from the Body Politic House of Yahweh, Yahweh Israel Estate, Thrift Funds LLC, to condemn Sacramento County agents doing business de facto as Sacramento County of. Furthermore, you are attempting to have a vote in favor of the use of funds needed to help the mental health victims to pay the law enforcement who are known to use their authority to harm the public 
to handle a mental health issue. That's suspicious. Sacramento County agents are defying California's full financial disclosure law. Every judge, sheriff, and district attorney, et cetera. We need to see every form 700 for the past five years. What are you really doing with these funds? Take care. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Hi, uh, my name is Teresa Flores. I live in County District 2. I'm a member of Sacramento Act. Uh, and I'm calling to reiterate the importance of having a 24 7 uh, mental health crisis response team that does not include law enforcement. I think we've heard um, already too many comments about how that uh, can end up with people literally being dead when law enforcement uh, respond to those kinds of calls. And um, at Sacramento Act, we know about uh, a lot of issues that are impacting our community, especially unhoused community, people with mental health um, challenges. And again, we've also seen how law enforcement can actually have a negative impact when responding to, to those kinds of challenges. Um, working in education, I also know that there's a lot of need for these kind of mental health crisis response uh, from youth uh, in particular. And again, we, we've heard from a lot of youth about the negative impact that having police respond to those um, kinds of calls can have. Um, in addition, you know, my son and I, just in the last few days, we've seen multiple sheriff deputies not even wearing a mask. And so if they can't even follow a simple health guidance, like wearing a mask, how can we expect them to respond to a mental health crisis? I think, um, again, we've heard too many examples of how that can not just go wrong, but how can people end up literally dead. So we urge the county to the County Board of Supervisors to support a 24-7 mental health response team that is not uh, just funded uh, at, the, at the low level, but that is fully funded to really um, respond well, especially during this time of crisis for our community with the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Uh, yes, my name is Robin, and I live in District 3. Um, <clears throat> I'm calling in support of Sacramento County implementing the 24-7 mental health crisis response system. Um, while more research is done and the response system is implemented, I suggest the county earmark $14 million for the program as a good faith statement to the public. $10 million was saved by abandoning the proposed jail annex, and there is $4 million uh, surplus in the sheriff's budget, so those funds can easily be used to um, be set aside, and then the concerns about where to find the money can be um, left inside. Um, additionally, I wanted to point out an important piece of the report provided by county staff. Uh, they mentioned how using the current 911 call center that staff would have access to whether callers have a criminal uh, history of quote unquote criminal offenses and the need for an armed response. This type of mindset is exactly why we do not need to have a call center or mental health response connected to law enforcement. Sacramento County and throughout this country, uh, we have a law enforcement system fraught with over policing, police violence, brutality, and murder, and incarcerate people of color and those in poverty uh, disproportionately. We need a mental health response that is not based on the quote unquote criminal history of the caller, but one based on the needs of the caller. Lastly, there were uh, concerns expressed about being able to find folks to hire. I would implore the county to look to mental health first. That's where to start when considering hiring. It appears from the report provided by staff that they were not even consulted, which is a slap in the face to the community. Not only were they mentioned frequently during the listening sessions I attended that the county put on, um, they've been mentioned to multiple times a day and many times over the last year or so. They have been providing service to our community on a voluntary basis for over a year now. We should be honoring their work and dedication to our community. Um, I feel hope for our county, and I'm looking forward to see how much a crisis response system can bring hope and care to our community, as well as reduce the jail population, which would help to sac help Sacramento County meet the May's consent decree, which wasn't really addressed um, in the, the report, but this is a side effect if we're not arresting people 
who have mental health um, crises uh, that will decrease our jail population. That's being able to help. Can you please wrap up your comments? Decrease. You have heard care in our cages for a while now, and this is a great step to actually carry this out. And I fully support this direction. So please support the 24-7 system with a separate call center. You earmarked $14 million for this in honor of the work of Can the Can you please wrap up your comments? Already doing the work. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, board. Um, I am calling as a concerned citizen of District 5. Um, I just wanted to express my full-throated support of all of the Mobilized for Mental Health advocates and, and the coalition that's built around this issue. Um, I think that um, most everything that these callers have mentioned is very important and should be taken into consideration. Um, I think it, it it's unintelligent, it's not wise, it's a conflict to um, include law enforcement in an issue that law enforcement has created. Um, so a lot of what these folks have said has just been very well thought um, and, and it makes sense. And it, it's really time for, for Stack County to do things that make sense. Um, I now want to shift my focus to uh, Chair Sue Frost. Um, I just find that your complete disdain for for human decency it's almost laughable i don't understand why you occupy the seat that you do if you don't want to be a moral example for your constituents and for your fellow board members you have no idea what other folks in that room might be facing um, folks have shared with you the loss of life in their own families from people who don't want to do a simple act like wear a mask. It abhors me that you won't do it, but know that you've been called on it and recognize that people see you. And I think that you might want to consider that for your next election. Your behavior is grotesque and it's embarrassing. It's very embarrassing for Sacramento County. I think we're better than this. I think we know better than this. And I think we can do better. I challenge you to do better. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Please send the next caller. <laughs> Hi caller, please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Good day to everyone except Sue Frost. My name is Steve, I'm a resident of District 2. Mental health crises do not follow a set schedule. We need you to fund a 24-7 community-led response to mental health crises like MH First and not involve police response. We don't want law enforcement showing up further traumatizing individuals experiencing mental health issues. Law enforcement and the carceral state, not to mention the capitalist system itself and its inherent racism, heterosexism, homophobia, are some of the primary contributing factors with respect to mental health illness. Um, law enforcement always exacerbates the situation. They are looking for statutes for someone to violate to justify arresting them, as though that is what is called for in situations like those. The criminal justice system is not the place or institution to be handling these situations. It's a matter of public health, not public safety. Joseph Mann, Daryl Richards, Antonio Thomas would be alive today if not for police involvement. And I would like to end by saying thank you to everyone except Sue Frost. And as Jiddu Krishnamurti said, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Have a good day. Thank you. Next caller, please. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Sure. My name is Nikki um, Jones, and just calling, of course, to encourage y'all to do the right thing, to listen to the community, to hear that 
um, what the problem has been cannot be the solution to the problem as well. Um, and I'm not, you know, I understand that the, that the process of removing um, these types of calls from law enforcement requires conversations with law enforcement to make that happen. Nobody's saying that's, you know, not, not part of it, but creating an entire system, what you do when you, when the 911 system is, is used is uh, you create a whole program whose lens, whose bottleneck, whose um, entry point is still that of a carceral system um, that has been the um, system causing harm even unto death for many. Um, people have said so eloquently, but I'll say again, you know, Marshall Miles, Dejan Plano, um, how many, um, you know, more recently others, how many lives uh, will we lose to the sheriff while y'all are debating um, how much power the sheriff should and these police chiefs should have in deciding um, how this program goes. We have experts in the community, we have experts in the field um, that can build this program and that uh, should have the opportunity to do that. Um, and you you know it has if if it's not 24 hours if it's not fully funded what you're doing is you're saying it's okay still for law enforcement to be those responders elsewhere um and it's not okay that is what the community has been saying that is the uproar uh it is not okay and it is causing harm um people suffering languishing um thank you to the woman who called in about um, her brother, you know, languishing and, and dying in the jail. Um, there is no Can you excuse please? for that kind of violence, and y'all have the opportunity to build Can you something different and comments? make a better... I, I absolutely heard the beginning of your sentence, too. Thank you. Um, uh, y'all have the opportunity to do something uh, different and better. You have the money to do it, and it's the will. You need to decide that you have the will, you have the support of the community, um, and, and you do not have to bow to um, law enforcement will at every okay. uh, turn Thank of you your decision-making. Your Thank you. Please send the next caller. Hi, caller. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. Caller, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Okay. Yes, okay. Please start with your comments. You have two minutes. I didn't do nothing. Were the last words of Maurice Holy before being shot by Sacramento County Sheriff Deputy. Deputy. Maurice Holy, a 55-year-old man, was shot and killed by Sac County Sheriff deputies after being called to respond to a suspicious man sitting in front of a home. At least nine shots were fired at Holy before a deputy thought he was reaching for a weapon in his waistband. A lawsuit alleges that deputies did not call for medical care or allow medical personnel to treat Holy in a timely manner after he was shot. And that allegedly, or that alleged delay of medical care caused Holy extreme physical pain and was contributing cause of Holy serious injuries. Wallace Gorey, his last words were, what are you going to do to me? Before Sacramento County Sheriff's deputy shot him. A 56 year old man was fatally shot by Sacramento County Sheriff deputies after an acquaintance called 911 to conduct a welfare check his wife reported that Gory had struggled with mental illness and suicidally for many years prior to that incident. When sheriff's deputies arrived at Gory's residence, he grabbed for a pitchfork and advanced at them. Gory was shot by one of the deputies after failing to comply with their orders and died at the scene. Brigitte McIntyre, a 32-year-old man, was fatally shot by Sacramento County Sheriff's deputies as he was running away from them on the Highway 50. McIntyre's mother had reached out, his mother had reached out to the fire and police officials twice early that day saying her son was acting very strange. Deputies fired 28 shots. How many guns does it take for 28 shots to be fired at someone? He was struck by seven bullets. 
six of them in his back. Sacramento County later settled a wrongful death lawsuit over the shooting. 1.7 million just for that one. Can you please wrap Bazon up your comments, Flanu. please? Bazon Flanu was a 40-year-old black man who was experiencing homelessness and a mental health crisis when he was killed by the Sacramento Police Department on April 26, April 2016, excuse me. Police said that Dazon was exhibiting strange behavior. Another strange behavior. Can you behavior please one. wrap up your and comments? And ranting incoherently. Are you going to hang up on the experiences of black lives? He was put in the back of a car and told he was not being detained. His mental health crisis escalated to a critical level from being Thank in you. the back of a police car. Thank you car. for your call. When the door was... Okay. Please send the next caller, and I believe this is the last caller. Hi, caller. Please make your uh, comments. You have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Lauren Sheely. I am a resident of District 1. Thank you for allowing me to comment this afternoon. I'm calling to advocate for an advisory board for the 911 Alternatives Response Program composed of community members, including peers, consumers, and family members with experience in mental health crisis responses, as well as community-based organizations who have been working on the ground in this area, such as Mental Health First here in Sacramento. I would also like to underscore how these law enforcement responses disproportionately affect black and brown communities. Input from an advisory board composed of impacted community members can provide valuable insight into the underlying dynamics of disparities. And this understanding is critical in designing a program that is successful and meets the community's needs. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there was one more caller, but they had already made their phone call. And so uh, we've notified them that it's one caller per item. Thank you. And Supervisor Cerna had some comments. Great, thank you. and I. I see that uh, I have the other colleagues that are in the queue, so I'll try and make my uh, remarks brief. Uh, first, I want to thank the callers that um, waited patiently to, um, to weigh in on this important uh, discussion. And um, uh, I really want to uh, acknowledge the fact that um, I think there's been a, a consistent um, theme of um, concern expressed uh, last time uh, we had this in front of us and, and certainly here today. Um, I want to try and uh, encapsulate it and, and address with the help of staff some of the concerns. And I, I don't know, uh, some of them may, may be a matter of uh, interpretation, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but there, there certainly has been a lot of concern expressed today by uh, public speakers about law enforcement and how do we, you know, how do we uh, remove uh, law enforcement from the equation? I think one of the speakers, uh, Nikki, who chimes in uh, frequently on this um, subject, I think mentioned uh, something that's worth repeating, and that is that the acknowledgement that there has to be some level of coordination in the process of developing um, the the developing the separation, um, the handoff, if you will. And I want to hear from staff, and Jim, maybe you can come to the podium, uh, and Bruce, you can be prepared to chime in as well. But, but can, you be, can you clarify what you feel is um, being interpreted by uh, some of the folks that spoke uh, this morning um, and, and maybe speak to this, this issue of what you're doing now when you're talking to police chiefs and you're um, you're you're doing what appears to be uh, and, and you know from their perspective perhaps more outreach to law enforcement than other groups um, because I think it's important for us to be on the same page with the the people that we represent to mutually understand what is actually occurring and why it's occurring the way it is and what ultimately is the the intention um, for for the relationship between law enforcement and whatever we develop. Yes, I'd like to address that. If you remember before the February 24th hearing. Could you bring we, the, the microphones a little closer, Jim? How's that? That's good, thank you. 
We had the listening sessions and the surveys with the community. We did extensive outreach. We got a uh, great response. And it was real clear what the community wanted. They want exactly what uh, was voiced by many of the callers today. They want an independent call center. They want a response that does not include law enforcement. Um, they want community involvement. And that outreach was done before that hearing. So we felt we had a real good handle on what the community wanted. I mean, there was no mistaking it. We were chided at the last meeting for not including our discussion with uh, law enforcement. So that was more of our emphasis this time. Mm -hmm. They are, as you mentioned, um, a key element of developing the protocols to determine which calls are safe for our mental health and peer staff to respond to and which require a law enforcement response. And that differentiation is, is uh, going to be necessary no matter how we implement this. And so it requires the discussions with law enforcement so we can develop those protocols. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a key piece of this. And uh, my apologies to the community for not being more, uh, in emphasizing more of what their desire in this latest report. But their concerns are huge. And quite honestly, how we develop this program, we will make recommendations and uh, it will be your board's decision as to how we proceed. And I have perceived a difference of opinion as whether we use 911 or a separate number. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, no matter what we recommend, that's your decision. Right. Yeah. Uh, Supervisor, if I may just add something to Jim's comments. Uh, as you asked about the callers and the perception, um, there's never been any doubt that the type of response we're talking about here is a non-law enforcement response. In Jim's presentation, he laid out what the model would be for our response team. So that it, there's no disputing that. The question that we are posing to the board is the type of dispatch system that we use here. The last time we were here, we talked about a standalone uh, system with mental health professionals taking the calls. Uh, the question is whether we focus only on that, or whether we continue to look at the system they use in the CAHOOTS model, for example, which is 911, mm -hmm. or a system that they use in Houston and other places where it's more of a hybrid. You have mental health staff in the 911 system, which by the way is staffed by non-law enforcement people to begin with. That's the issue here. If the board's desire was that we only look at a standalone system, we could do that. We felt that it was important to put before you whether or not we look at these other approaches as well in the context by the way of what's going on at the federal level and the state level but there's no doubt that it'd be a non-law enforcement response on the street to the situation that's a very important point it, it is an important point i'm glad you stressed it because i think there's a uh, there's clearly i think some ongoing um belief that w some somewhere we deviated and we've already made up our mind and we have a preconceived notion that uh, we're going to sugarcoat this and pacify those that have expressed concern right. um, and we'll ultimately have law enforcement joining the clinicians and the mental health uh, service providers and you know I for one I'm am more interested in a kind of a wholesale change I mean that's why I think we're here is is we've heard the community um, ask for that and and rightly so, uh, citing a number of instances that were, we were reminded of today. Um, so that's why I wanted to have this, uh, this question and answer uh, period with both of you on that uh, key point because it was almost to a person common in, in what we heard. So uh, I thank you for that. Um, in terms of budget, there, was, there, was, uh, there were a number of concerns expressed um, about um, why aren't we discussing uh, the numbers right now? Why aren't we having a you know a robust uh, conversation about the budgetary consequence of uh, a new you know of a paradigm shift to a non-law enforcement response for mental health crisis? And again, I'm looking for um, uh, you to explain uh, both of you again the process or even and the process so that it's clear to people what we're doing today separate from what we plan to do perhaps even with another 
workshop or meeting before we get to recommended budget in June, final budget in September. So what we did today was provide you with information about the three models you asked about. So you have those dollar figures in the board report and Jim had it in his presentation. Um, the question of how we fund it, of course, is a budget discussion that we have to have that we bring back to you in June and then follow up with September. But I start to sound like a broken record here. We have an important development here though. We can get 85% matching funding here right. in our system. We think we should consider that and what we bring back to you as part of the budget discussion. Yeah, I mean, that, that to me seemed like, you know, some of the, some of the better news that we've heard. Yeah in a while. Um, I think it's critical on that particular subject, Bruce, the, the uh, prospect of using that, uh, the, that federal uh, aid uh, for this purpose. If we can distill that down at the right time when right. we're certain that it's going to be used, and I understand there's still the State Department of Health Services has to do their thing, but I think at the right time, I think that ought to be the subject of a very clear um, explanation to our community members that are watching this very closely so they understand that this, where the money's coming from and how it might be complemented with other sources and I know that there's there's some that uh, are insistent that uh, the, the funds come come from the sheriff's department um, it's still unclear for, for, uh, to me in some respects whether that is just intended to be punitive or if that's intended to um, if, or if that is simply where folks are looking at because it is continues to be the largest you know pie slice in our budget which i totally get um so i'm not i'm not advocating uh, either one but it but uh, at this point but it seems to me that 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 good news is something we want to um exp explain very clearly so that when people share their concerns about uh where's the money going to come from we have a really solid answer right Right. I should say, Supervisor, that we're, we have our federal lobbyists on this with us. We've got our state lobbyists working with us at the state level. The news on this came out, frankly, after the board letter and everything else was pretty much developed for this. Uh, but it is good news. And uh, the other thing I wanted to point out, too, that responded to the uh, caller's uh, points. We're talking here and making a recommendation to about a 24-7 system yeah. and further thinking that through. So we recognize the importance of that. No, I'm glad you made that point, and I'll, I'll uh, be quiet here in a minute and hear from others, but uh, I'm glad you mentioned it because there were a couple of callers that uh, reminded us that, you know, mental health crises don't happen at a given time during the, the course of the day, just like a uh, regular health crisis uh, don't respect the clock. So um, that's important to underscore. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Cerna. Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk. Thank you, you know, Jim, for the, the presentation and Bruce and all the work you've done on this. Um, you know, it's interesting as we have this discussion, it just kind of strikes me as it's almost a little bit counterintuitive to call this an alternative to 911. It's an alternative to law enforcement. I mean, that's what we're striving for. And I think, uh, you know, you talk a lot about the, the community and the community speaking. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there are a lot of my constituents were involved in those discussions, but my constituents also share the same sentiments in that they want a better response for folks suffering from a mental health crisis that does not involve law enforcement. Um, I, I've dealt with that in my own family. I've had discussions with some people in this in this room here um, about struggles in my own family where we've called and law enforcement was the only option. Um, and when it's a dangerous situation, clearly a, a hazard, uh, that, that's appropriate. But there are a lot of other times where we'd be better served by having a, a professional there and without uh, using law enforcement. So I think adopting that terminology is, is I think, important for this, just intuitively how people think about it. And just to, to um, piggyback on, on some of Supervisor Cerna's um, you know, questions and, and comments about the 911 system. I mean, my experience with the 911 system is, as you know, it's been evolving for, for decades in the state of California. And as, as Supervisor Kennedy mentioned, um, it is a comprehensive emergency response system. I mean, it is not, so that's, I think that's the other thing that some people forget sometimes. It's, it's not just a law enforcement system. The, the, there's a, there's a very large body of state law that, that designates, yes, law enforcement for being the initial call taker, but th this is state law that, that directs that, that for any emergencies in the community, it comes through that system. So I, I think we should, you know, we need to develop good policy here 
Um, and, and keep in mind that just because it's somehow affiliated with the 911 system, and as Supervisor Kennedy and Supervisor Cerna both pointed out, you, you have to involve law enforcement so you can figure out how to not involve law enforcement, right? I mean, that's what we're trying striving for. But also keep in mind that all these organizations that rely on 911, whether it's law enforcement or fire or EMS or, or the CAHOOTS program in, in Eugene, they also have non-emergency lines or separate dedicated numbers. So I think ju just because we, and I don't know where the board will decide to go, uh, ultimately on the details, I mean, it's, I'm very heartened by the fact that it seems like we all support this. Um, um, I, I, just because we rely on a, a 911 system or the current kind of structure that's in place doesn't mean law enforcement is in control of this. I mean, I have a lot of friends who are firefighters and ambulance drivers, and I tell you, they would certainly bristle at the notion that they are somehow controlled by law enforcement just because the initial calls come through the 911 <laughs> system. Um, I, I, for one, would uh, um, am very eager to, to get started on this. I mean, I, I, I like that we have the good news, and um, I, I just I hate to wait till next year to implement something. I sure wish we could move quickly. I mean, you look what the city of Sacramento is already doing and what they're implementing. I mean. I mean, and maybe even in the interim, we can adopt something that's that's like that in the unincorporated area. And, you know, I don't know, but that, that's definitely something I'm interested in while we're working out some more of the details with the other jurisdictions and where while we're waiting to see what happens at the state and federal level. So um, but but I'm, I'm very, very much in support of this of this program and just want to finish by um, applauding Supervisor Kennedy for his, his leadership in this area. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. Supervisor Natoli. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I too would certainly echo comments to my colleagues uh, in thanking the callers and certainly those who participated in the community process as well as obviously the uh, work that's been done by Mr. Wagstaff, Mr. Hunt, uh, certainly in the direction of um, Ms. Edwards and, and a host of other folks I'm sure that have assisted in this regard. I want to um, bring it back to a couple of points here. Um, I want to talk about the Community Advisory Board <clears throat> Uh, matter, but um, first I want to go back to the to the budget uh, because we've had discussions uh, actually within the last couple of weeks regarding policy direction and board uh, uh, had quite a lengthy session um, just a week ago and talking about some recommended policy framework uh, for not just reserves but how we would uh, make uh, funding recommendations and direction to our our staff around that and so. I want to bring it back to some of the points were made by some of the speakers, but also I think it goes back to this issue about what may have just uh, come forward as, as good news on uh, federal dollars. Because one of the policy recommendations, and again, uh, maybe I speak a bit from experience here, is that, uh, and we didn't adopt this last week, but it's certainly been embedded in budgets for uh, for years and years and years, for decades, so it's not anything that's uh, new and way of thinking is that the county, uh, you know, wouldn't backfill or overmatch. And so if we buy into a federal uh, allotment of dollars and that brings good to this county, that I think it needs to be clear as we frame this up, and this is not for the de decision today, that, you know, we stand up a program, however we choose to fund that, that it's not going to be subject to some ever flow of if it's gonna be a 24 seven system, there's not gonna be some ever flow that comes from federal or state services. Those are realities that we deal with in any given budget year. But uh, just in light of that conversation, again, I hadn't heard the word, as I said last week, word overmatch in a long time. But that gets built into thinking, into uh, recommendations in this board by the time it gets to us in, 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 in the budget cycle. You know, decisions are made then about how money is parceled out. So again, I'm not reading into the, any things more than just that if we choose those sources, then the commitment though still needs to be clear that going forward, and we don't bind future boards or you know future budget decisions, but it needs to be really clear that it's not an overmatch, it's an opportunity that allows us to you know be very robust in standing something up if we choose that. And the reason I raised that issue is because I also, heard commenters talking about MHSA and realignment dollars. And in the same breath, we've heard certainly some today, but in the past, you know, concern about taking from other areas in the in the health realm, whether it be mental health or uh, public health or 
uh, other things to support you know a, a good quality of life uh, in the in the realm of health services that we not you know take from those sources uh, in order to do something else now again those are choices that are presented so I, I, I make these points because I'm concerned that going into June and September um, but particularly into June that understanding dollars get roped off and they get allocated as there has to be some sort of decision guidance given in June and that by the time we get to September recognizing there's a need for program development that you know even if the board desires to, to do something that then depending upon what may be out there or not that then we, we were faced with choices of having to pull it from another department and again I, I recognize this tension between law enforcement and and, and, and health services and the commitment of, 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 of budget uh, allocations in a given year I just don't want us getting from my perspective kind of getting trapped in that unintentionally um, and I just I, so I raised the issue right here and today because it, it, in my view again we, we make choices we only have you know limits limited uh, discretionary dollars when it comes to to uh, to general fund and so forth but on the other hand uh, those limitations oftentimes we impose on ourselves because we choose not to fund something or we say well as long as you not just with the federal I said overmatch but even with transportation monies and other things that's the money you get that's all you get you don't get something from the general fund so again just from the standpoint of thinking I want to be very straightforward about this I'm concerned that going into June that you know if, if we're looking at an allocation that's 10 15 20 million dollars whatever it might be we won't all be spent in the first year because it's gonna take a while to stand this up I just want to make it really clear that I I want to have flexibility as one member of this board in that conversation both going into June but also certainly into the September time frame and again I appreciate the work that's been done around this because again if there are funding opportunities we gotta draw upon them but we need to design a program that's going to be best for this community do what you know certainly with this board and this delivery process decides is is best coming from the community from our you know professional staff and from others and I just I, I again I'm, I'm concerned about that just in light of I think of the you know, thought process so I, I make that point I want to go back to this community advisory board if I could for a moment because there hasn't been much talk about that I don't know in the other communities whether that's you know a, a, a foundational element but I think as we talk through this and certainly work our way through it I think that's a very important part yeah you know, I think so that's, supervisor if I could on that yeah. point um, I think what the caller were reacting to earlier in, in our public forums the suggestion was made well we I should back up we had always wanted to have an ongoing advisory body on this system as we roll it out and as we operate it and the suggestion had been made during the public comments that maybe you could just tap into an existing advisory group like the mental health board mm -hmm. uh, clearly the callers didn't like that idea and they were reacting to that but and we can relook at the type of advisory group we have on this we acknowledge we need to have one and it needs to be community members uh, if that's not the right approach perhaps we should think of another one but we do need to have that okay okay again because i am very supportive of that I, I i haven't heard anything to the contrary amongst my colleagues and, and i didn't hear that be contrary from the staff but i want i think that community advisory board and how we you know uh you know choose to construct it and so forth obviously is something that that we'll have to you know have further discussion around but uh that's reassuring um in the staff recommendation and recommend actions a couple more items i wanted to touch on one is and i think jim talked about it um this um, analysis of expanding the, the mental health urgent care clinic uh, you know again having been on the board the years I have obviously the reductions we made at the mental health treatment center and and uh, you know we really haven't uh, you know put dollars back in that would give us the 24 7 component in several callers but I think we acknowledge that you know that front door certainly for the existing response you know is is I won't say it's non-existent but the emergency rooms have you know borne a lot of that or people ended up you know uh, uh, you know being booked into jail or or, or 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 other things happen but I think that uh, that's really important and I think uh, I, I one would like to see us have that conversation when I talk about sooner rather than later that's a piece I think that again we you know rolled it out a couple of years ago with establishing urgent care but it doesn't that doesn't operate 24 7 either and I think if we're talking about a system-wide approach here, both on the response, but I think to the to the issue of, you know, uh, having alternatives that you know, uh, uh, you know, really look to the uh, to the crisis and, 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 and some appropriate responses. So I guess I would ask, as a part of this uh, direction, 
rather than just um, you know, some further analysis of that, I'd like to have that for you know, right front and center discussion come the June budget. Right. I, think, I think it's really important. Glad to. Okay. Um, one, one last thing I just wanted to touch on, and again, it was in the embedded in the recommendations, it was um, <clears throat> on, on number two, um, was it said explore and ex propose a specific area of the county to begin a mental health crisis response system. We touched on that a little bit in the discussion earlier this morning. I, in my view that, uh, you know, if we're going to roll this out, again, it may be done in phases, but we need to take a look at the entirety of the county, and that may be a big bite, a whole one bite, but nonetheless, you know, people live, work, and uh, visit this county in, you know, across a thousand square miles, and I don't think we should just limit this to a particular neighborhood. Obviously, we may have a higher preponderance of, of calls, uh, you know, based upon, you know, historical data, but I think this needs to be, when we, when we bring this up, it needs to be made available to the entirety of the county, assuming we have buy-in from the you know, city jurisdictions as it relates to some of the, the handoffs, but nonetheless, the system ought to be available to the citizenry of this county, whether you live you know, north, south, east, or west. And so I just, I feel really strongly about that. There are costs associated with doing that, but I just think you know, kind of doing it bits and pieces doesn't really work. I, so. Can I just chime in here real quick on that, that last point? I think it's really important because otherwise um, <laughs> you're gonna have communities pitted against each other and you know there, there'll be winners and losers and um, this is way too important to to leave it to chance that you know we're gonna um, you know start some disagreement between neighborhoods or you know communities in the unincorporated county so I totally agree with Don on that one I think that's good feedback thank you and, and, and lastly then again I know others still want to speak here but I I, I you know I, I appreciate the work that's been been done around this in a fairly short amount of time uh, and I, but I, I can't stress, I think, uh, any better than some of the folks that called in, you know, some of the urgency around this, because any moment of any day, someone could call in, we'll have an incident responded to or a situation responded to, and either good things or bad things happen. And so I think, you know, that in the back of my mind and listening to the commentary today and in the past, and I think we've all had a chance to reflect on that here <clears throat> this morning and early afternoon. And so. Uh, that just drives me in you know, some of my comments to, again, we want to do this. We want to do it right. Uh, there are budget considerations, but there are, are, you know, there are real, real people, real lives, real families uh, that are uh, affected uh, in one way or the other. So, uh, I'm going to keep pressing this in, in, in that regard. Again, it's not because you're not doing good work and you know bringing your best recommendations to this board, but I just that sense of urgency really sticks with me today. So I would like to see us. Again, as I said earlier, and I'll conclude with this, is that if there's the ability to begin to implement something sooner uh, in a way that's meaningful, that doesn't disregard, obviously, community and, 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 you know, and, and the concerns of staff, then I can see us do that. And if it's mobile crisis response teams, at least having the addition of some of the folks that we've heard from, the, you know, the peer councils or the uh, other um, <clears throat> uh, mental health professionals, and start that right away, uh, you know, that to me would be a, you know, I think a good basis for, you know, again, building the, the larger program here, which we'll see in a few months, I trust. But again, there's urgency, I believe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Natoli. I, I know that uh, Supervisor Kennedy is queued up to speak, and I'm assuming he's going to wrap up. Are you? Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm in a position to wrap up. Um, I'm oh. just going to make comments, just like the rest of us. Um, I uh, and and these are really in, not in any particular order of importance. It's just I was writing down while comments were coming in. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is, and I just and callers talked about it, but I noticed it when I got the staff report as well. How we started down this path uh, of investigating, and this is not a loaded question, by the way, <laughs> um, uh, of uh, co the CAHOOTS model and the STAR model were kind of the ones we were looking at, and now we've moved to crisis now. Um, I just, just a, a short answer as to why we're making this shift. I, I just. Evidence based, a full county implementation. Uh, non 911 call center. Okay. Uh, I mean, those are issues that have been brought up for discussion. This is a place where it's been implemented in its entirety. So that's a model for us to look at. And if we decide to go with a non 911 call center, uh, it's a good model to implement. Fair enough. 
Um, I, I mean, I will admit that I, uh, along with members of the public who have called in and said so, when I first read, you know, Maricopa County, the first thing that comes to mind is Sheriff Arpaio, and so I immediately get nervous. But um, <laughs> you notice he's not a part of this Crisis yes, Now yes, program. I, I understand that you, he'd have to do it from prison. Um, <laughs> the 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 other. Um, I am glad to hear about the interest in the, uh, the the community advisory board. I do think that that's important as well. Um, other callers have called in, and we've gotten emails about, um, and again, this none of this is in order, uh, about uh, funding from the jail construction that the board previously has put off or canceled um, but didn't enter into. Uh, maybe the CEO could could you know address. Is, is that doable? Is that, is it, what? Yes, I'm happy to answer that. Um, the money that was set aside for the, the ex building of the mental health and health facility, um, we still have significant ADA issues that need to be addressed in both the main jail and our triple C. So um, it's not like we can just not do those things and, and reallocate this money. Those things still have to be done in addition to somehow addressing the booking area in the main jail. And then finally, um, since we're not building the new annex, uh, we are going to have to significantly reduce population in the jail. And in order to do that um, safely, we will have to fund um, significantly more uh, programs for folks in the community so we're going to need a lot of money for all of those things okay thank you um, have we collaborated with uh, the healthcare systems uh, on this at all I mean for, for particularly like UCD this only comes up because I had a meeting with them about something else and we started talking about this and there seems to be an interest so we might want to reach out the health systems yes um, they were not I, included in the in the discussions, but we need to. Since it's since it's their ERs that yeah, we're we should going probably to be do more of that. It would probably yes. be a good idea, and they may actually be helpful. Well, uh, we certainly got yeah. some input from them regarding the uh, issues in their emergency departments. Right, constantly. Thank you, um, MHSA. So there was a caller that called in. It sounded like a foregone conclusion that this was going to be paid for by MHSA. I, I don't remember having that conversation, frankly. Um, of course, whenever we're looking at mental health services, we look at MHSA as a potential. There's no question. But even if we were to go after MHSA funding on this, it still has to go through the MHSA. Absolutely. Committee. Yeah, yes, absolutely. We have, so, you know, so, have not. So, so uh, no, the MHSA dollars wouldn't be spent in a vacuum in the county does no, as we're doing it. It the, has to go before the MHSA. Absolutely. Yes. The, the MHSA dollars have a very clear-cut process. We all know that. And if that was the course we were take, we'd follow that process to the word. Okay. Thank you. And finally, um, you know, the, the subject comes up regularly about as we're looking at budget dollars and so forth and the, the, sh the sheriff's budget. And um, I appreciate uh, Supervisor Cerna's comments, uh, whether it's punitive or not. And, you know, I, I have been saying that I think that, that, that parts of this funding needs to come out of the sheriff's office or de department budget, in my opinion. Um, I don't find it punitive, uh, though it is a question that is worthy of asking. Um, you know, be, be, I mean, whenever you're looking for funds and you have different buckets of money, uh, you, you always got to look at the biggest one. And uh, let's face it, the sheriff's department is a huge drain on the, not a drain, but it's a huge part of our general fund. And so I still think that it's just from a financial perspective, the prudent thing to do is to look at, you know, our, our largest areas of expense where it's relevant. And, and I think that it's entirely relevant here uh, because there is such a clear nexus between what we're trying to do and the operations of the Sheriff's Department. Uh, we would be, hopefully, the idea is to alleviate some of the workload of the Sheriff's Department if we do this correctly. So therefore, why not look at Sheriff's budget? Um, and, and furthermore, um, the 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 idea that this that doing so would compromise public safety i think shows that we too narrowly define what public safety is what this whole discussion we've had today has been about public safety and so if we were to take a, a, a inadequate amount of money that would normally and traditionally go to the sheriff's department budget it for something like this that in my opinion is directly related uh, 
I think that we are increasing public safety and not decreasing it. So I, I just think we need to look at public safety uh, a little differently than we have traditionally. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kennedy. I had a couple comments I wanted to make. Um, I wanted to first say that I I agree with um, I'm trying to remember who who said uh, let we should start as soon as possible. I think it was Supervisor Natoli that that um, we should start as soon as possible. But I I and I and I think to get started uh, it it wouldn't necessarily mean that we would have to start everywhere. Maybe we can start somewhere uh, and with the pilot that we originally discussed. Um, the reason I say this is because your comments early in your presentation regarding the potential 80% um, matching funding from the federal government and possibly more from the state uh, would, and possibly legislation that would, would be statewide mandating some type of a program that could ultimately change the whole branding the whole number the whole everything and the cost of basically branding that and educating to supervisor kennedy's point which was well taken that it does cost a lot to train the general public to get that in their mind that that's who they call in that scenario I would feel bad if we, we got out there ahead of it, one year ahead of it, and then had to turn around and change the whole thing and spend twice as much on the branding. So I, I feel like, um, I feel the same way though. I, I hope we can get started as soon as possible. And I did talk with some of the, uh, the um, law, law enforcement community um, regarding the conversations and they were, uh, they felt very positive about this program um, and I was excited that there might be that potential where t to Supervisor Desmond's and I think Natoli's comments regarding you know the 911 system and is there a way that this can be part of it maybe, um, maybe there's a way it can be part of it until we know where this is going and we can separate it out entirely I don't know um, that way we're not, uh, I'm not really sure, but I, I think uh, I like the idea of 24-7 um, rather than uh, part-time. I, I totally agree with Supervisor Cerna who made the comment regarding these things don't just happen at certain times of the day. Uh, having experience in the emergency room, uh, I know that firsthand. And I, I also um, want to uh, express, oh, I toured the, the mental health facility and I, you know, I, I know the, the challenge of having a place to take them or the, you know, the, the, the resources once we have this, you know, 911 center, we need to have, uh, it's going to, be a huge lift but it's important that we have those resources and I wish there um, I wish there was a way that we could maybe apply some of the consent decree that this could maybe satisfy some of the consent decree I don't know if it can in some way if we're reducing the size of our jails and we need more programs outside um, I, I wish there was a way that um, we could have that conversation around maybe a mental health facility or um, you know the re maybe maybe there's a way we can change the way we look at what we were going to build in next to the jail and have that be the resource that you know that actually reduces um, inmates and actually provides the care that, that people need and I um, I I also wanted to just close by um, thanking first Supervisor Kennedy for his leadership. I, uh, I think this is, uh, and I want to especially thank the staff for all your hard work and your open-minded 
the way you have um, approached this, you came back with something so much even better. It's getting better every time. That's just amazing. So I wanted to thank you for that and look forward to our conversations. I, uh, I guess my concern about the money, um, because we were told that the money is tight, we have to satisfy the consent decree, and that if we allocate money to something, it will take from something else. So I'll look forward to having those budget discussions and understanding what are we taking it from and how's it going to impact the programs, the great programs that are already in place. So those are my comments. And at this time, I think you were just wanting uh, direction and I believe yes, we gave it. Is that correct? We have a clue. Okay. <laughs> so do we, are you asking for action? You had recommended actions, which was an action item. And I think you've <clears throat> heard comments, as Chair said, from all of us and to Jim's response. So do you want us to reframe that in the form of a motion or is it clear? I mean, obviously you've heard individually but collectively here, so. Uh, Supervisor, I think you've, you've been clear in terms of the 24-7 approach. You made it clear, I think th that was the sentiment of the board, a countywide uh, approach to that. Um, I think you are interested in us continuing, as we say in the recommendation, to explore and do further analysis on expanding the mental health urgent care center. Um, and we certainly heard the comments about starting something at least as right. soon as possible, and we're gonna explore those options. Um, one question I would have, maybe Jim views it differently, is on the dispatch. Um, we proposed exploring both the standalone as well as how we might use 911. Um, it wouldn't hurt supervisor if we perhaps had some clarity on that. Oh, I believe uh, the, are you talking about what I was saying? I mean, just as no, the, just board. the board. Okay. I heard the different board, comments yeah. from the yeah. board on that. I, I believe at least th there was some, there were some some availability in with within some of the jurisdictions of the law enforcement not with the sheriff but with law enforcement whereby there they could accommodate you having an operator within their that operated independently within their system and they welcomed that and i personally think that would be an opportunity for people that are new to to learn from the this dispatchers that are already there that have been triaging a lot of this uh, to to just be able to take advantage of learning about the system and so forth and not that that's maybe the end goal but it's a good place to start to see if there's efficiencies there that would save us money that we could spend it somewhere else. That, that's just my thought. Uh, Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, maybe to get some clarification, because I don't think it's a point that should be lost today, because I think staff obviously does not work around this. So if, 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 to be clear, if we have a standalone number, whatever, it, you know, whether it's the 988 or, or or a 10 digit number, I think it needs to be a simple number though, I would concur with that, that 10 digits is a little <laughs> difficult to remember at times. Um, but, I, but I would question then, so even with a standalone number, folks could call that, but if they, is it intended that if they called 911 that there would be the ability within the system and whatever jurisdiction, whether it was the unincorporated area and or the, the uh, municipalities, that then with, with the standalone number that they would do the handoff? Or, or, or so just, to, just take a moment because I think you're seeking direction, so I'd like to have some clarification, at least what you were thinking, Jim, or what the proposal you were looking at. It is our desire in working with law enforcement, all the different agencies within the county, that when they receive a call that they can do their triage and determine as a mental health call, they would forward it to us and we would respond. Okay. So we would so so the the standalone would be this the central central in the sense that either it'd be the intake and or it'd be the handoff, uh, it, but it would serve serve a dual role then in, in, right. in that respect. Okay, well again, I'll just offer my comments. I I, I think it probably makes good sense to to have a standalone. Um, recognize you're still going to what Jim said, have agreement with the cities uh, that in the event that they feel those calls. Um, then there needs to be the ability to, to hand it off because otherwise 
what is the handoff? You may have a clinician there, but then there's a, again, I think it gets a bit confusing, um, although there's some costs associated with the, with, the, with the standalone number, but in my view, I think you need to have that, so. Uh, you know, I think standalone is good, but I just hate to reserve a number and then have the state come up with something different and have to start over. It would just be so confusing to everyone. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm thinking uh, maybe start with start with that and graduate into well, the Well, the standalone other. might be that number. I mean, that may, that may be the centralized number that everybody has that number and that, you know, that's where you funnel it through. I don't, I don't know. If I understood correctly, that was part of the discussion. You were waiting to see what the state would do with the nine with the 988. 988. And it would be universally universally applicable then, and then but we could, you have to design your own system around that? The, uh, the intent of the original legislation was to mandate counties use 988 okay. as a mental health crisis calling center. Okay. Um, it's very likely that there will be no mandate. And a lot of counties just don't think much of mandates, including us. Uh, so it could be optional. Uh, it's possible there's a hybrid system that comes in where we start out with our get care phone number and when 988 is, comes in that's just another line that comes in uh, the, there's just too much that is yet to happen for us to make a definitive answer have they reserved nine excuse me have they reserved 988 then it's it's already it, the federal it's already ro that's roped off then they yeah, you, you we couldn't say we want to use 988 right now without because the state the state has already got that number reserved. Well, the, the Federal Communications oh, Commission federal. has uh, designated that, and they are not bringing it live for anybody until July 1, 2022. I, I understand. Okay. Uh, Chair Frost, if I could add, the, yes. if the 988 is going to become available in July of 22, um, there's a lot of um, costs associated with setting up a, a standalone call center. And I know we want to start before July of 22, but I think what we're looking for is direction on whether we continue to explore maybe the use of 911 in the interim before July of 22, or do you want us to just solely focus on a standalone number until 988 becomes available? Is that? That's good. Okay. Yeah. I, I personally think if we use the 911, we can maybe have resources to focus our, it's, 22 isn't that far off. It's going to come pretty quickly, and this is a huge th thing that we're putting together here. It's a whole new system that we're putting in place. It would seem more efficient to use the 911, in my opinion. Um, Supervisor Desmond's queued up next. Thank you. I, I, so, you know, I, I feel like the um, when you talk about a standalone call center, that, that doesn't necessarily have to be inconsistent with the 911. I mean, 911 already... When they triage calls, a lot of times they send it to other entities that are not, you know, fire or law enforcement. They, they send it to a host of others. So I, I guess my question is, I think you put a price tag in there of $5.1 million to set up a standalone. Was it, was it your vision to have it as a, like a dispatch center with computer-aided dispatch yes. and monitors? Yes. So I guess I don't understand. Why couldn't it just be a, there would be a crisis response uh, service office in the East County, you know, South County, wherever, and, and as calls come into 911, they're sent right to that phone number, or calls can be originated by the 10-digit number that, that has been created. I just, I guess I don't understand the need to have a, a full dispatch center that resembles like a fire dispatch or a law enforcement dispatch. If we do an independent number, that is necessary. Um, if you recall the presentation we made in February, our call center was staffed by mental health clinicians. And so whether the call comes in from the public or comes through 911, we have that group that does the initial triage assessment, uh, linking folks with services so that a field response is not necessary. And regardless of which system we use, we would want that call center uh, to be in place. Uh, if you recall my presentation, we estimated 78,000 calls coming in uh, when the system is fully operational, but only a little over 12,000 actual field responses. That's because this call center of mental health clinicians does that triage, initial uh, assessments, referral for service, and, and uh, de-escalating the situation so that a field response isn't necessary. Okay. All right. That I just I guess if if you just it relied exclusively on 
say, putting a mental health clinician in certain 911 centers throughout the county, you're still going to have a lot of those same personnel costs, it seems like, that are, that are driving yes. the call center that you're envisioning. Yes. Okay. But you won't have to have a separate call center. Correct. It seems a lot, lot more efficient, but... Well... And, and either way, we, you're going to have to train dispatchers yes. throughout, throughout the county. And, and you know, when, when, when we were a little bit of back and forth about getting something started, you know, I, I agree with Supervisor Natoli and Supervisor uh, Cerna that, boy, it, it, would be, it would be best to get something countywide. But I, I think the bottom line is you're gonna, you might run into some issues with police chiefs that will say, hey, I don't care what you want to do, Sacramento County. I'm not going to abdicate our role you know, in, in keeping citizens of my city safe, right? That's what I'm saying. We may, we may run into some practical challenges there. Um, that, was, that was my only reason for suggesting that. But, yeah, still, still a lot of issues to work through, I think, with respect to how it's going to work with those other cities. And, and whether it's embedded in a 911 center or it's standalone, um, I, I think I'd just like to see a little more comparison between the two and what it would take from a resource perspective. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. So on, the, on this particular um, aspect of what we're uh, contemplating here, I think there's a lot to be said for uh, independence, um, whether it's the number, the call center, however you want to describe it. Um, and let's not forget, too, that if we have a separate system um, and you know, it'll take some adjusting um, on behalf of the public, on behalf of um, law enforcement agencies, no doubt, no doubt about it. Um, but that's also why I think it's going to be extremely important to brand this appropriately and educate, uh, do a public education campaign around it, a really, a really um, robust one. Um, but once, once it's up and running, I can you know, certainly see that it, it would actually be a pressure relief valve of some sort for 911. So I, I think we have to look at it both ways. Um, that, yeah, I guess for simplicity sake, you could wet it to the existing 911 system and, and perhaps uh, not have to go through the exercise as much about branding and, and all that. Um, but if this is really um, intended to um, get law enforcement out of the business of uh, responding to mental health crises, I, I think we need to be very uh, clear about it and have a, have a distinct separation, and that includes how the, the public uh, would interact and um, ultimately be able to um, avail themselves of, of the service. Um, so again, it, you know, it's ultimately, I think it would probably end up being a cost savings to the existing 911 system. I just ask one question, Madam Chair, just sure. on the, so the federal 988 will become active and available July 1st of 2022. Is that correct? So roughly 15 months from now. Mm -hmm. And... And, and, and then who's going to be responsible for taking those calls? If it's a federal system, you call 988, is every local jurisdiction either opt-in, opt-out? We've used that discussion here today on another. The, the states will have to opt-in, yes. So th that could be lengthy. I mean, you know, it's one thing for the federal government to say you're going to have this number, but then states have, the state has to opt-in, or and if they don't, then counties can't or cities can't do it on their own volition, right? Correct. So it sounds like there's a lot more mechanics to it. It's not just not going to be a July 1st, 2022 date. It may be effective then, but and again, I, I would think if that's applicable either statewide or, 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 or nationally, that makes good sense. And again, to what Supervisor Cerna said, if we spend a lot of time and effort promoting our own number, which is well and fine for the residents of this county, and then it gets kind of undone or gets you know. <clears throat> Um, o overtaken by a, a more, you know, a broad effort of state or national. So again, I may, maybe to the point here, I guess a little more exploration uh, you know, of, of this to have an understanding. I, I think having independency, I, I would agree with what Phil said, is important. And I think that, you know, to probably, but I can't imagine that even if we gave you the direction this very moment, that you're gonna be able to stand that up, you know, in a matter of weeks 
it's probably a matter of months, and it might be. So I guess having some understanding about what that entails, not so much the budget piece of it, I think you've been pretty clear about what that takes, and there may be some options as you move into um, you know, in, in, into that role if that's what we decide. But I do think having an independency and whether it's a 988 or our own number or 10 digit or, but <clears throat> again, recognizing that if we're gonna, I guess, kind of lead on this, yeah, we're gonna take some risk and it may be, there's the budget piece of it, but you know, we're looking at what's best for the people of this county. And I think, uh, you know, with that in mind, <clears throat> you know, if we give you a, a few more weeks, I don't know what, what else will be known. If you need direction around it though, I'm, you know, I'm willing to explore how you, get there, but I still, I guess I would just say I would land on the side of having something that's independent in the sense that, you know, you can go to that number and get an immediate response 24-7 uh, and uh, for mental health crises. And if people access it through 911, that it comes back this way so that people can respond appropriately. Obviously, that's going to require cooperation by the 911 responders as well, or dispatchers. So. Thank you, Supervisor yeah. Natoli. I don't see anyone else in the queue to speak. So are we, I think we're clear that we, we want to move forward as quick as possible. What we're not in clear on is how we accept the calls. Right. So I think what I, what I hear the board saying perhaps is some further exploration of, of this. I don't, it doesn't sound like the board's prepared to say one way or the other at this point. I'm not sure we can't. I, I have the impression, you know, in our last meeting that public safety really wanted to be in the conversation and that uh, after you met with them, they were they they were excited about what you were doing and wanted to even make a place for you in their call center to help you get started in their jurisdiction so that you're like part of them. That was kind Am I did I misunderstand that? That was one option. Okay, so if we're doing it countywide, we we can't just, I, I don't think we can just disregard those jurisdictions without Not at all. And, and conversation what I would say, how it happens. What I would say is if we do that, that's uh, a clinician in each of the 911 centers, that's a lot of staff. It would be more efficient if, if your board's desire is that we funnel it through 911 initially, then we maintain our call center. We'd probably do it with fewer people as we initially start up. But uh, having the calls come through 911 and referred to our call center, uh, if that's your board's recommendation, putting a person in each of the call 911 centers would be better. But I don't know that we'll have the staff to do that. And of course, if we choose a target city or two or three to do that with that's that's a lot easier so you staff six different or seven different be six different uh, that's what it sounds like uh supervisor frost is asking for yes i i don't know that i i, I guess i i was under the impression that that would be more efficient and cost effective than a whole call center with all the equipment and right right all the you know i thought that was more efficient i guess to start until we know we have a number that's separate that the goal end goal being to get a separate number so a supervisor if i may i think i hear two things uh that we might have to think give some thought to how we blend because you would like us to get started as soon as possible uh, on some kind of approach. Um, so perhaps we have to find some way of, on the interim, uh, utilizing 911 with uh, mental health staff. If Jim makes a good point about our ability to actually uh, get enough staff to do that, uh, working towards a standalone system that um, be consistent with what the state's gonna come out with. Uh, but I, I hear two things. You want a standalone system, but you want us to get started pretty quick too so trying to find a blend of those two things can, can I ask a question on sure. um, so if we were to, to do that have some kind of interim understanding about uh, divisional labor when it comes to receiving calls and dispatching Bruce um, is that something that you think we could deploy let's say you know by this by the summer and then once we finalize things in September, as we draw closer to perhaps the beginning of the, 
the new year, uh, we transition that? I think we'd have to explore that, Supervisor. I couldn't say definitively right now, but we could certainly explore that, what we could do. I guess the way I'm envisioning this working, I mean, practically, is that if I don't know about a separate number, let's say, um, I'm an instinctively want to call 911. So I call 911 and they say, this is 911, how, you know, what's your emergency? Then if they uh, convey or they communicate to the dispatcher, a uh, person that picks up the call that there's a family member that's having a crisis, that's in crisis, then that dispatcher would then route that call to our clinicians or whomever's going to um, uh, maintain the, the, the separate space that's dedicated to um, getting resources out for, uh, for that, that particular incident. Um, it seems to me that might be the first phase of it. And the second phase is once the public and everyone else is a little more accustomed to things, is it goes, you know, and, and including the public, the calls go directly to that, that mm -hmm. um, individual or sets of in, individuals. That, and, and you kind of take out over time the 911, you know. I, I think that's what I was trying to describe. I think you did it better than okay. I was supposed to lay out. Yeah. I personally I agree think, with that. I, yeah. I agree with that too. I, I think, but I think even if we had all the money in the world and we could start a separate number right now, uh, we there would still be those people who will call 911. So this mm -hmm. is like that unique opportunity where we can actually have mental health people um, embedded to train 911 um, through the you know transition of of those calls which will happen for a year or two or whatever and then and then all of a sudden one day they won't call 911 anymore because they'll know it's 988 but 911 you can't just cut it off people are still going to call there mm -hmm. and they're still going to transfer it to 988 even mm -hmm. if you have that separate number so this could be that perfect opportunity for training uh, you know i guess training forward how it works Patrick, any thoughts? No, I, 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 I mean, I agree. I, I can see envision, you know, as part of the media strategy in the future, of having billboards that say "30 days till 988 goes live," you know, and, yeah. and you know, and really yeah. use that as an opportunity to brand this and yes. get it in the zeitgeist of our community. Um, I just wanted to use the word zeitgeist, by the way. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it, so I, I, I can see that. I, I would like to, because you know, any decisions better made with the most information possible. So I would like to look at what the comparison is to those. So you'd be looking at a, a, a transitional period of time. That's what I'm hearing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're glad to do that. That provides us the direction we need. Okay. Yep. That'll, that gives you enough uh, information to begin to build the budget. So the next time we have this conversation, we know what we're talking about in terms of cost. Yes, sir. I think so. So do you need a motion? I think you summed up the previous yeah. four or five, and we just talked about uh, number three. I, and thought the, so. I thought the other aspects were pretty clear yes, in terms were. of your okay. feedback. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jim and Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. And we got a good start making good progress today. And so at this time, I'll ask our clerk if we can go to the next item, please. That would be uh, county executive comments. No comments. Thank you. Thank you. And then you have your uh, supervisor comments, reports, and announcements. I have Supervisor Natoli. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't have <coughs> announcements uh, or comments as much as I do. I have um, uh, three items brief that I want to touch on and would ask for some follow-up. Um, I had a <coughs> chance to um, talk to the county executive at least on one of the items, but there are a couple of others that have come up in the intervening time. Uh, two of them relate to um, <coughs> uh, Mather. Um, received a... Um, comment uh, a question last evening uh, from one of our partners there that's working with Mather's Veterans Village. It's, uh, it was uh, the Veterans Resource Center. I think they're nation's finest. Uh, and they've been working on a lease amendment for some time. Uh, it's going through our processes, but 
it was brought to my attention, and I didn't have a chance to talk to Ann, I just got the, the uh, email this morning, uh, that uh, they're incurring some holding costs for those lease amendments, of 80 to $100,000 a month, to, which could be direct services to, to veterans. And so uh, I guess it was slated maybe to come back to us May 4th, and it's been reviewed, as I understand it, through uh, some of the county household. My request is, is if there'd be a possibility to actually get that back to us, maybe soon. I don't know if April 6th is too quick, um, uh, but apparently it's, it's been vetted. It's just a matter of getting on our schedule. It would be a consent item, I trust. And so, Ann, if you could take a look at that. Again, it seems to me if there's an ability to, you know, if, it's, if everybody's in agreement, to get it to us sooner rather than later, um, I think it would be a good thing. So I'll check into okay, that. Okay, thanks. Um, the other item at Mather is that in our hearing of January 2020 on uh, Mather South, one of the, the items that came forward uh, during the course of the conversation, board members may recall this, um, in considering the development proposal, there was a request by residents of Independence at Mather, some of the folks that live out there, um, who spoke concerning the support of the efforts the county had made to to replot the um, uh, some of the road structure out there so it would avoid the, the vernal pools and the wetlands. Uh, but there was a request that uh, to reverse a board action that was taken back in, I believe in 2007 or 2000, maybe in 2009 or 10, uh, that uh, proposed to rename the uh, Zinfandel or Eagles Nest Road from Douglas South and name that Zinfandel as an extension of Zinfandel <coughs> um, Drive. And uh, because we did a realignment of the road and so forth, folks felt it would be important to retain the historical name, Eagles Nest Road. Um, and so uh, I had asked at the time as part of our hearing and board action to have that initiated and come back. <coughs> I got a response last June that, well, the neighbors could initiate and so forth. I've asked several times through the course of the last few months about initiating that, and, and it wasn't on your watch. Um, you know, I'm very interested having our board consider that. Um, you know, there are some internal costs associated with that, but we are the sole landowner between the golf course, the preserve, uh, the park, uh, and certainly in our partnership with Mather South. And so I think it makes sense, and I've asked a couple of different departmental representatives, and I don't know who's entrusted with this, but I would like to see that um, get to us uh, in, in, in a relatively short amount of time. I mean, there's not a tremendous urgency, but I would just note that it's been in process, and I've gotten different responses from folks over time, so. So, can I, can I ask a question, yeah. Supervisor Natoli? It's my understanding that there's a cost associated with this that usually the person requesting the change covers, and you're asking us to bring an item to you to waive that cost, is that my understanding? The, the, as a member of the Board of Supervisors and representative, I'm asking that we initiate that. That was part of the conversation if people wanted to look at it. Now, the Board didn't take action to initiate it, but I'm asking for our consideration that we initiated the initial um, renaming of the road, and I'm asking that we return it to its original name and that this Board take the, reverse the action that we took. So that wasn't an action that was initiated by the landowner or property owner. It was initiated by us. So okay. I don't want to get too deep into it, Lisa, but I just certainly am responding to the county executive. So thank you. I'd like us to reverse our action. Because nobody told me about any costs that were associated with us doing the first time. So I guess we can build it into our budget. Yeah. Lastly, um, <clears throat> and would be, I'd like to request that we have a item um, placed on our May 4th agenda. Uh, three years ago, in May of 2018, our board <coughs> um, initiated uh, <coughs> or, or reviewed a concept proposal for uh, repurposing a, a portion of the Boys Ranch for a, uh, in, uh, a organization, uh, Sacramento Shelter Pets Alive. Uh, since that time, there's been a lot of discussion. They went, they went before the community and, uh, and have uh, submitted a revised proposal, and <coughs> it's um, one of those things where there's, there's some urgency as it relates to that organization, a small organization. They've met some of the insurance requirements, have submitted a proposal in the last few weeks. I'd like our folks to put that as a priority and to actually have for our consideration, again, whatever staff would be recommending, but have it before us uh, for the May 4th agenda if possible. Okay. Okay, thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Supervisor Natoli. Supervisor Cerna. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I have a couple of things. Um, the first is, uh, well, they're both uh, similar in that they're follow-up to actions we took last year. 
Um, the first is that we have outstanding work in front of us in terms of um, establishing by resolution uh, a racial equity policy cabinet. And this is subsequent to the resolution that was adopted um, declaring uh, racism a threat to public health and a public health crisis. So I just want to make sure that we're all collectively not losing sight of the fact that that needs to happen. And um, I'm certainly rolling up my sleeves and, and more than happy to work with whomever, whether that's Lisa and her staff or and her staff to, uh, to get that teed up so that we can uh, get in front of the board for consideration. Uh, and then similarly, we um, adopted, uh, as was made mention of at our last meeting, we adopted a, um, uh, a, uh, a resolution uh, establishing a commission on uh, 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 girls and women's issues here in Sacramento County. Um, we, we need to go through uh, the exercise of actually uh, filling the seats on that, uh, that commission, and we have uh, specific appointments to, to consider. So um, those two items I'm, I'm looking at, and just as a, a way for her to um, kind of keep me uh, on track and uh, remind me frequently if I'm not making any progress. But it's something I'd like to try and get done by uh, the summer. I, I don't think it's going to be too much work. We are actively working on both of those items, and Terrific. I can keep you apprised. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. And um, at this time, we ha do have an adjournment in memory by Supervisor Desmond. Thank you, Madam Chair. On Sunday, March 21st, 2021, Ed Marzell, a longtime resident of Carmichael, passed away peacefully surrounded by his family. Ed was a living embodiment of the American dream, a self-made man who came from nothing and built an incredible business with his hard work, ingenuity, and natural intelligence and charm. Ed began his business, California Retail Management, in Carmichael, and now the business has petroleum operations in four U.S. states. Ed was an, an Ohio College graduate who served in the Army, then sold auto accessories, and later created one of the most thriving businesses in Sacramento. He was known for his personal touch with his customers and putting family first as his business model. Ed is survived by Susan, his wife, and two children, Annie and Adam Marzell, and two grandchildren born in the last year, I believe. Annie and Adam are executives in the family business. They describe their dad as an incredible father and grandfather and thoroughly enjoyed being able to work alongside him. Ed was known for his humor and boundless generosity. He will be greatly missed in the community, but his legacy will carry on with the Marzell family and the incredible work he was able to accomplish during his life. Please join me in honoring Ed Marzell and, and adjourning today in his honor. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Desmond. And uh, at this time, this meeting is adjourned in memory of Ed Marzell. May he rest in peace. <laughs>